Gunjan Saluja, and uh, finally, Dr. Feroz. Okay. Thank so this you. Is the, and uh, I would like to tell everyone, uh, we are live. I mean, uh, it's almost 7.30. It is 7.30. So shall we begin? Yes. Uh, technical team, please let us know if we are live so that we can begin our session. Yes, you are live. You, would you, you like me to share my screen at this point? Uh, just a minute, ma'am. After, uh, I will hand it over to the moderators and then you can share the screen. So good evening, everyone from India and good morning and afternoon to all our overseas delegates. A hearty welcome to all of you. Welcome you to the day two of this fantastic International Ophthalmic Conclave 2022, organized by the All India Ophthalmological Society. We are live from Hall E and I'm your host, Sneha. Please join me in welcoming our chairpersons and moderators, panelists, and all the delegates for AIOS International Oculoplasty Session. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us the chairperson, Dr. A.K. Grover and Dr. S.M. Petharia. Also, along with the, the chairperson, we have the co-chairpersons, Dr. Usha Kim and Dr. Lashmi Mahesh. The moderators, Dr. Gunjan Saluja. And the panelists, Dr. Mukesh Sharma, Dr. Santosh Honavar, Dr. Milind Nayak and Dr. Feroz P. Once again, a warm welcome to everyone. And before we move forward, I would like all of you to humbly request that the presenters, you should keep the presentation in time, that is eight minutes, and we shall have the Q&A post all the presentations. So the timer shall display the countdown time and I shall notify you during your last minute. Thank you. And now without any further ado and great zeal, I would request the moderator to take it further. Over to you, Dr. Gunjan. Uh, thank you for that welcome. And uh, I would like to invite Dr. Carol Shields. First of all, I would like to thank her for accepting our invitation as always. And I would uh, invite ma'am to please share her presentation and enlighten us with the wonderful topic of interference in conjunctival tumors. So uh, thank you, Gunjan. I just take this opportunity to welcome everybody. I'm uh, Professor Namrata Sharma, the General Secretary of AIOS. And thank you so much, uh, all the speakers, the panelists, and I would like to thank Gunjan for putting it all together. And Dr. Carol Shields, thank you so much for always accepting our invitation. Thank, thank you, you, Namrata, for having organized this entire event so beautifully and having got together such a lot of luminaries in all the sessions and particularly in this session. Looking forward to this wonderful lot of speakers and the beautiful lot of subjects that are covered and all the effort that AIUS has put in, Namrata has put in. Thank, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Perfect, perfect. Okay, and uh, I have no financial disclosures and is it moving appropriately? Yes. Okay, so I'd like to speak to you on conjunctival squamous neoplasia, the impact of cigarette use and vaping and where is the interferon? So let's review conjunctival tumors. We performed a large analysis on over 5,000 cases of conjunctival tumors, and we found that in our practice, 50% are benign and 50% are either pre-malignant or malignant. And what are the specific diagnoses? Well, you'll be sad to see that there are many different diagnoses in conjunctival tumors from chorostomatous to benign and malignant epithelial tumors, and on and on. And here's the long list that we found in our analysis. But the big three are ocular surface squamous neoplasia, melanoma, and lymphoma. This represents about a third of the tumors that we see in our ocular oncology service. And there are several pre precursors like papilloma nevus, primary acquired melanosis, and lymphoid hyperplasia another one third. But for the purposes of this talk, I will speak on ocular surface squamous neoplasia and will not speak on the melanocytic or the lymphoid tumors. So let's get on with ocular surface squamous neoplasia. This is a fleshy vascular mass, usually at the limbus with leukoplakey. It's usually non-pigmented. It tends to occur in older Caucasian males, but it can occur in immunosuppressed patients 
HIV organ transplant patients, and with smoking and now vaping. There are some factors to consider like HIV and organ transplant, such as seen in this patient who had a heart transplant and squamous neoplasia at a young age. And squamous neoplasia can occur in small, intermediate, large, and giant sizes. Now, just out, just this month in Ophthalmology Times was an article by Dr. Hall, which was presented at the American Academy of Ophthalmology 2021. They looked at the iris registry at the American Academy of Ophthalmology and found 15,000 patients with malignant ocular surface tumors over a six year period. These malignancies occur highest in the North Central states in the United States and lowest in the West and most prevalent in white males and smokers. We treat ocular surface squamous neoplasia either surgically or non-surgically. And here you can see an example of a tumor, but it's bigger than that. And it's even bigger than that. We always look carefully at the slit lamp for the exact size of the tumor. And when we resect it, we go wide, at least two millimeters around the tumor and with cryotherapy. So here you can see before and after surgery, a nice clean wound. And here's an example of the surgery with us applying absolute alcohol to the corneal epithelium, removing the corneal component with a 57 blade, cauterizing all feeder vessels, making our incision two millimeters outside the tumor. Often there's a lot of blood, carefully removing the tumor down to bare sclera, using a limbectomy approach with a 57 blade, and then removing the tumor before and after just two weeks later. Now the diagnosis is not always correct. For example, this case came in with a gelatinous mass, but it had primary acquired melanosis and that was an amelanotic melanoma, much more serious than OSSN. And this case sent in as a melanoma actually proved to be a pigmented squamous cell carcinoma. And this case in an African-American looked like a pigmented squamous cell carcinoma with some frothy surface epithelial abnormality, but we got an anterior segment OCT. And if you look carefully at that, you can see there were cysts within this mass, suggestive of a nevus, not a melanoma and not squamous cell carcinoma. And then this last case, frothy mass on the tarsal conjunctiva referred as squamous neoplasia, but it was sebaceous carcinoma on biopsy, much more serious. And the entire posterior lamella of the upper lid had to be surgically removed. Now, what about non-surgical treatments? We have mitomycin C, 5-FU, interferon, injection of interferon, and PDT, all used for various different tumors. More and more nowadays, we love the use of interferon, but we're forced to use 5-FU. I'll explain that in a minute. Here we see before and after, topical interferon. It works. It's an amazing medication for squamous neoplasia. And sometimes we inject the medication when there's extensive mass and you can see the mass resolved, leaving only a small residua with interferon alone. Now we were reported in Cornea 2021, the impact of smoking on OSSN. And we found that smokers tend to have significantly more involvement of the inferior fornix and the inferior tarsus, and they tend to have larger tumors. So here you can see an example of a non-smoker with a tumor at the limbus, and then a smoker with a tumor in the inferior fornix. We ask all patients with OSSN about smoking and vaping. Here's a patient who was a smoker who had bilateral squamous neoplasia on the right, and a little one on the left. Now, what about vaping? Well, we just published this in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology a year or two ago. This was a young 17-year-old patient who had very fine epithelial thickening. You can see on anterior segment OCT at the arrows. And sure enough, we resected it and it proved to be intraepithelial squamous neoplasia in a heavy vapor who had five years vaped. You can see the dyskeratosis, the active mitosis, PAS with atypical mitosis and active proliferation. 
So when do we use interferon and surgery? We use topical medications if the patient is medically unstable, and it, but it requires them to purchase the drops, place the drops, and they have to be compliant. And these drops are expensive, except for 5-FU. We like to use surgery as our first technique because it establishes the diagnosis. And in 15 minutes, we have complete control of the tumor. The team out of Bascom Palmer have done a match comparative analysis and found that the cost was the same, whether the patient used interferon versus surgery, and the recurrence rate was the same, about three versus 5% risk for recurrence. Here's their analysis on cost comparison, and they found that it was equivalent cost for the full course of either topical interferon versus surgery. Now, there are rumors that interferon may not be available this year, so we have switched to 5-FU. Here you see a patient who had squamous neoplasia at the tip of a shunt for glaucoma, and after 5-FU, it all resolved. You can see on enter segment uh, OCT the appearance, and then the tube shunt after resolution, and it has all resolved. Interferon has gone to COVID, and several major groups around the world is actively looking. We've even spoken to the FDA. They said, the American Academy of Ophthalmology said it is out of their control. And there is one company in, in uh, China that is making interferon, but I'd like to speak to you about this later on. I will skip quickly, just mentioning that we occasionally do plaque radiotherapy when there is corneal invasion and it does work and we've published on this. So in summary, this is conjunctival tumors, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, the impact of cigarettes and vaping, and hopefully interferon will return. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for that uh, enlightening talk. And uh, are there any comments from the other speakers? Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? I am Dr. Mukesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A wonderful talk, ma'am, as usual. Great teaching. Uh, my question is that do you use always a single dose that is 1 million per ml or sometime you resort to 3 million per ml? Like what is your preference dose? Or uh, sometime you use one or three like... Uh, what are your criteria? Yeah, so there's two considerations. If it's a topical drop, we will use 1 million units per ml interferon. Okay. If it's injection, we use five to 10 million units in a one cc TB syringe and inject it under the tumor and balloon it up. And we use injections when the tumor is large, or the patient is very elderly and we doubt that they'll get the medication in. But now interferon's off the market. We only have a little store at Will's Eye Hospital uh, where we might have another month for using it and then we have no more left. I know Bascom Palmer is out of interferon and Atlanta Emory has just a little bit left. So I'm hoping someone in India is making this medication. Yes, we do have some few companies who are making it. Uh, and that too, very cheap. One other question is, you prefer 5-FU over mitomycin eye drop uh, or? Uh, uh... Yes. yes, we do. We do because 5-FU, we tend, it's much cheaper. So it's like $100 versus $25. So it's cheaper. We think the, the a comparison of the two, they're probably equally uh, effective. And with 5-FU, our regimen is QID for two weeks, then off for two weeks. So it's a quicker, it's quicker um, uh, and a shorter uh, treatment duration. Okay, thank you. That is a question again. Um, for Indians, we, it, it would cost us something like $15. Um, so do you think uh, we should be shifting much more to the medical management as topical therapy? as compared to surgical? Or would you still say the surgical is the option for the localized tumors as the first choice? I think it's perfectly fine to use topical therapies as a first option. However, if the patient does not respond after 
say three months, then you might consider excision just because perhaps it's an amelanotic melanoma or perhaps it's a sebaceous carcinoma or perhaps it's a mucoepidermoid squamous cell carcinoma that might not respond to topicals. But I agree with you. It is perfectly suitable to use topicals as your first therapy. In our practice, where we see people from far away, we often don't have the luxury of putting them on topicals and bringing, bringing them back. We have to make a treatment plan to cure them as fast as possible. And but would, I there be any indications, would there be any indications for choosing mitomycin or 5-FU over interferon on the basis of the size of the tumor or depth of the tumor or would you always have interferon as the first choice if um, the cost is not a factor? Yeah. We really like interferon because patients are perfectly comfortable when they're on it. Uh, when the patients are on 5-FU or mitomycin C, especially they do have some pain. I, I am okay to use 5-FU as a first line drug. I think, it's, I think it offers excellent control. It's cheaper. I know in South America, it's the first line drug. And I know now in Florida, it's the first line drug over interferon. So Dr. And now Cameron, in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Thank Dr. You. Fruz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Dr. Grover, can I? Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Yeah. So Dr. Carroll, uh, going to the uh, expenses with interferon versus uh, five of you in India, Dr. Grover already told that it's 15 US dollars for interferon and uh, five of you, it's almost just 25 cents. So it's that cheap uh, in India, yeah, and we produce it, so. I will <laughs> talk to you later about how to get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I think now we can move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Allen from Texas. And uh, we all have seen his videos while learning oculoplasty. He has around three, more than 300 videos of oculoplasty in his YouTube channel. Over to you, sir, for uh, describing the indications of orbital fracture repair. All right, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is just current recommendations for orbital fracture repair. So a much simpler uh, topic compared to what, we, what Dr. Shields just, uh, just presented. I have no financial disclosures. I, I'd just like to start with some quotes from my clinic. Um, first one is, I don't see it, doc. Second one is, I don't look in that direction. And then the third one is, I don't know how to measure 50% of the floor. So are there any hard and fast rules for orbital floor and medial wall fractures? So again, we're just gonna be talking about blowout fractures. So not NOEs, not ZMCs and not Lefort fractures. And I think really what it comes down to is what the indications are for the repair and what the timing is for the repair. When we think about blowouts in general, again, this should just be medial wall or orbital floor. The rim should not be fractured. If the rim is fractured, then you need to think that there is an associated, uh, associated facial fracture. We sort of think of this as a protective mechanism for the globe. Uh, there's thin, bin, thin bone on the floor as well as the medial wall. And basically there's very little resistance to fracture on the side of the sinus. So when we look at our orbital floor, this should not involve the zygoma. The zygoma is a very thick bone. This should be involving really just the maxillary bone. Sometimes this extends to the ethmoid bone. This should not go posterior to the pterygopalatine fossa. So sort of the anatomy of the orbital floor fracture. Um, when we look at the medial wall, again, this should not extend superior to the frontal ethmoidal suture. Again, this may extend close to the optic canal, should not be anterior to the posterior lacrimal crest, might involve, uh, involve a little bit of the lacrimal bone, and then again, can extend to the orbital floor. So we sort of have these isolated orbital floors, isolated medial wall fractures, and then we have a combined medial wall and orbital floor fracture. So what are the sequelae of blowout fractures? Well, we have increased orbital volume and this can result in inophthalmus and later fat atrophy can contribute to this. If we get tissue prolapse or entrapment into the fracture, we can get a restrictive strabismus. Again, I always say that a uh, entrapment is a clinical diagnosis, not a radiological diagnosis. So this is something that 
uh, don't believe your radiologist necessarily with regards to entrapment. I think that this is a clinical diagnosis and we'll talk about that later. You can also get damage not only to the sensory, but also the motor nerves. And so you can get V2 hypesthesia, and then you can get a paralytic strabismus. And how do we figure out, well, what's the difference between a paralytic and a restrictive strabismus? Usually we're going to do four suctions. So this is a, a kid with a left medial wall fracture, and I'm having him look to his right, and you see that he has a paralytic strabismus. Now, we don't treat paralytic strabismus with surgery after trauma. In general, we let this resolve on its own. So if he has, has negative force suctions, I am not going to treat him. And again, how do we figure out if someone has positive force suctions? To me, this is usually an intraoperative uh, maneuver. And what I mean by that is that I rarely do this in the clinic, um, but I do do this before and after surgery in the operating room to prove that I have I have a restricted strabismus. And then secondly, at the end of the surgery that I have, that I have uh, released that, that tissue. So I think one of the biggest things to always remember is that there are differences with regards to indications and timing of repair, depending upon age. And children, uh, you know, bone bends and this may incarcerate tissue. So this is basically a green stick, green stick fracture. This has implications for repair. And we always have to remember that these fractures can be missed by the radiologist. Whereas in adults, as we get older, our bone gets brittle, it breaks, and we get larger fractures. So with regards to timing of repair, we think of this thing of, a, of a, in children as a wide-eyed blowout fracture where the bone bends, incarcerates the tissue, in particular the inferior rectus muscle. And then if this muscle is not released, the muscle can become ischemic. <clears throat> There's really no controversy regarding the indication or timing of repair for this type of fracture. We try to repair these fractures within 12 to 24 hours. And this is not a mystery when they come into the emergency room or into your clinic. Um, you know, I've seen these, these, these fractures occur in patients as old as uh, 20 years, but when they present to you, they have extreme limitation of up days and gone down gaze. They may have bradycardia with eye movement. They have significant pain with eye movement. They don't want you to touch them in the emergency room and they're often nauseated. And so this is our typical picture of a kid with a wide eye uh, blowout fracture. Why do we call it a wide eye blowout fracture? Because they really look pretty good externally. They don't have a lot of hemorrhage or anything. And when I have him look up and will look down, this eye does not move at all. And so when we look at the CT from this patient on coronal, we're looking at the left side and we see this muscle start to dive into the fracture. And then as we move posteriorly, you know, we sometimes call this the missing muscle sign in the sense that you lose the inferior rectus. Why do we lose the inferior rectus? Because it's on the other side of the fracture, it's in the sinus. And so you can imagine that this muscle being caught in this tight fracture is not good for it in the sense that it's going to become ischemic. If it's not released, if it becomes ischemic, it dies. And then you have a muscle that's neither going to contract nor relax. And so, you know, if you don't repair these patients relatively quickly, they're going to have this very narrow window of single binocular vision potentially for the rest of your life. So we like to repair these very, very quickly. So here he is after surgery, looks much more healthy in the sense that he's no longer looking miserable or sick, no longer looking green, having him look up in complete, uh, complete motility if you get these guys closely enough. So adult blowout fractures are really where the controversy arise, arises and are, resides. And I spend a lot of my time protecting patients from surgeons who want to operate on orbital fractures. And, you know, it's not so much my oculoplastics colleagues, but I think it's a lot of my uh, otolaryngology colleagues, as well as my maxillofacial surgeon colleagues who are still sort of believing the traditional teaching that has been out there for many, many years with regards to the indications for repair of orbital fractures. So let's talk a little bit about in ophthalmos. So if we look at many of the books, traditionally, they say that two millimeters more of in ophthalmos is significant enough to operate. And there have been quite a few studies that show that, gosh, you know, 
patients really don't notice two millimeters of the ophthalmus or proptosis or, you know, axial difference between their two sides. And so for me, I really let the patient decide how much an ophthalmus is significant to them. So what does that mean? I have them come back after their orbital fracture. If they have formal, full motility and I, and I am measuring some in ophthalmus, I basically ask them if they notice it. The vast majority of young males, if they don't have any double vision, they don't want surgery. And, you know, to be quite truthful, an older patient who, you know, would have to undergo general anesthesia. And if they're anticoagulated, you might have to stop their anticoagulants and put them at risk. They really don't care if they have two even three, maybe even four millimeters of inophthalmus. However, on the flip side, I have had a few patients who complain of one millimeter of inophthalmus. Gosh, is this, is this true or is this, uh, you know, something that I'm not noticing? Fracture size, traditionally 50% or more of the floor was considered to be an indication for, for repair, but now I really treat the patient, not the scan. I do not do surgery to prevent up in ophthalmus. I treat the ophthalmus if it's noted by the patient and usually see the patient two weeks after trauma, have them follow up in a month. And lastly, with regards to strabismus, traditionally, even if, if there's evidence of restrictive strabismus two weeks after the fracture, you know, basically, traditionally, it was thought that if it's there at two weeks, you should operate, but rarely do I do that. I see them at two weeks and ask them if their double vision is continuing, continuing to improve, if they even notice the double vision, and then decide what to do from there. So if we have this small fracture, I'm finishing up just here quickly. Uh, you know, most of us would not feel the need to operate, even though the radiologist may claim that there's entrapment there. However, in a bigger fracture such as this, she has restricted restriction to up gaze at two weeks, larger fracture probably is going to need to be operated. So who said what? You know, coming back to our first quotes. I don't see it, doc. That was my 25 year old with three millimeters of bit up So I said, you know, your eyes sort of sunken in. Do you want to do something about that? He didn't want to do anything. Lastly, or secondly, I don't look in that direction. That was my 75 year old who had significant up gaze restriction that I could elicit in clinic, but she said, you know, I just don't look in that direction. And then lastly, I don't know how to measure 50% of the floor. That was me because I really don't know how to measure 50% of the floor when I see these fractures. I know if it's a big fracture or a small fracture, but what does 50% really mean? Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, sir, for that wonderful talk. I really agree with you that usually we have to protect the patients from getting operated. And there is always a tug of war, which is going between the cosmetologist the, and the, the oculoplastic surgeons. And sometimes even the radiologist add on, okay, there is a fracture. Why are you not treating it? So that's true. We should treat the deformity and not the CT scan or not the scans. I would like to have a word from the other panelists also. Any comments? The house is open for discussion. Agree with you, Richard. Um, it's a question of nuances, really. Uh, most of those cases uh, who do not have a significant enophthalmos at the end of two weeks are probably not likely to need um, a surgical intervention. And the double vision that is not in the physiological gaze uh, is only in the up gaze, which is not being used by the patient, would definitely be a choice for conservative management. The only cases uh, where we may really think of surgery are a large defect in the floor visible. 50% is just a um, benchmark. Uh, but if you notice a large defect, you would consider if, it, if an early enophthalmos has appeared, you would think of the long-term consequences because a, an enophthalmos, once it occurs, even after restoration of volume because of the, the volume loss of fat, et cetera, may be very difficult to take care of. In a seeing eye, you are reluctant to inject anything into the orbit, and the volume restoration may really become difficult, even if you did a three-dimensional replication of the other side and corrected the bony walls. The loss of fat may be a problem. So maybe in the larger fractures, where you do think that you have more than 50% of the surface of the floor involved, looking at the sagittal and the coronal cuts, you may consider a repair, even if the enophthalmos at the end of two weeks is just about two millimeters. 
Yeah, no, I agree with you, uh, uh, Dr. Ashok. I mean, uh, I think one of the issues <clears throat> or one of the concerns uh, always discussed is, gosh, is uh, delayed fracture repair more difficult than early fracture repair? And I think that's still controversial. I mean, I have a lot of colleagues who say, you know, six months doesn't make any difference compared to two weeks. And, um, you know, but on the flip side, I think all of us have, have tried to have tried to repair, uh, you know, in ophthalmists one or two years later. So that can be very, very difficult. I think the, the most difficult floor fractures for me are the, the combined medial wall and uh, orbital floor fractures. And for me, my approach to those now is to actually make a large uh, transcurricular that extends to a transconjunctival incision and then release the inferior oblique. And that gives me a 180 degree view of the orbit. And I feel very comfortable with that incision and I, I have minimal strabismus afterwards. I think a little bit of it is elicited in, in far lateral gaze, but in general, it uh, usually allows me safe exposure to put a large step fracture. But it's a, it's a great question with regards to, uh, you know, does delay, is delayed repair more difficult than repair at two weeks. And I, I just don't think we have the data, but I think many of us have anecdotal evidence. I'd love to hear from Dr. Agree with you again, uh, again, agree with you with regard to a very large exposure. I really love to make big periosteal incisions and do a big lifting and make sure that I've covered the walls very well and a transcurrencular exposure as well. Because without that, you can't really do a good justice to a medial fracture. No, I agree. I agree. Thank you, sir. Uh, so now I think uh, there are no more questions. So now we would move to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Gangadhar Sundar from Singapore. And sir is going to speak about the pearls and pitfalls in the management of post-traumatic or vital reconstruction. Thank you, Dr. Saluja. Is my slide visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Really an honor to be with you all. I'd rather be there in person. I bring you greetings from this part of the world. I'm going to share my experience on pitfalls and orbital reconstruction with a lot of overlap with what Dr. Allen beautifully elucidated earlier on. These are my disclosures, but there's no conflict of interest with any of these from his presentations here. So like uh, Dr. Allen mentioned, I'm going to classify some of the pitfalls because we as surgeons, you're right, we have to protect the patient and heal the patient. But oftentimes we end up with errors. And so I'm going to classify them into diagnostic errors errors related to treatment planning, and finally, most importantly, iatrogenic, surgical, intraoperative, and postoperative complications. So first about diagnosis, you can both underdiagnose and like Dr. Allen mentioned about overdiagnosing these fractures and keeping an extremely low threshold for intervention. He already touched upon the concept of white-eyed fractures and I completely agree with him. It's not just a matter of what you see in children, even young adults in the twenties can have this white-eyed fractures. Uh, I would not just call it a blowout fracture, but sometimes these are trap door fractures, but not typical blowout fractures. And every once in a while, there are missed findings injuries. Gone are the days where you're treating fractures with plain x-rays. You can see the sinus is completely clear. X-ray report said there was no fracture. It's only on CT scan that you're able to see localized hematoma within the maxillary sinus. This is an example of a combined floor medial wall orbital fracture with dystopia, which requires an intervention. Here's an example of another child, very similar to what Dr. Allen said, where nausea, vomiting, monitored by neurosurgeon, CT brain cleared, normal, and CT scan was reported by an a radiologist as normal, but what they missed is that little entrapment right over here. The grain echo the finding that entrapment is the clinical diagnosis. You are the clinician should be reviewing the CT scan before you go ahead and uh, managing uh, these patients. Other pitfall we do is sometimes we do CT orbits and diagnose these fractures, ignoring the fact that the patients may have mid-facial, even lower facial injuries as these patients. This is an example of a cranio orbitofacial injury where you want to be managing these with multidisciplinary teams, not just fix the orbit alone. And we've seen patients where implants have been placed in the orbit, the rest of the face has been destroyed. He already touched about overdiagnosis, keeping too low a threshold. Remember, not all limitation movement is related to uh, entrapment. Post-duction tests occasionally is indicated in the operative, in the clinical situation itself. 
Here's an example of a patient bilateral nasal lacrimal conduct injuries where these kind of community fractures before the medial wall of the maxilla is mobilized. We prefer to do prophylactic intubation to avoid a post traumatic dendritic stitis. Quickly touching upon pitfalls and timing of surgery, he beautifully talked about how a pediatric fracture should be done as soon as possible. The first question I always ask is when did he or she eat last? ZMC fracture should be done within a few days, within a week, otherwise, it becomes very late. As you can see over here, this is a gentleman who goes got a deformity, was referred to us two months later with a significant deformity. Going and doing an osteotomy for him is going to be quite challenging for him. Lower fractures, typically a couple of weeks, again, it can be one week to three weeks or even four weeks based on the symptomatology of the patient. And finally, enough thermos can be managed at a much later stage itself. So you don't want to do too early an intervention. You don't want to do late an intervention in these kind of fractures. Finally, I'm going to touch a little bit about surgical complications. Be aware, patients can die during your surgery. Patients can go blind to your surgery. It does happen in my hands, and I've seen it around as well. And you can have other complications, but the one complication I'm going to touch upon is diplopia itself. So intraoperatively, again, Dr. Grover mentioned about a problem-related inadequate exposure. You can have bleeding, you can have intraoperative metriasis, which makes you pause, stop, or even stop reconstruction and challenges related to implant placement itself. This is very important. I always say the beginning surgeons start off with lower and larger incisions, wide exposures, see the landmarks with your naked eye, don't depend just on instrumentation because your implant may not go where the implant instrument goes, but you want to see where the implant goes itself. Pay attention to the various structures that need to be preserved. At the same time, make sure that you don't have the assistant avulsing the eyelids and causing an hydrogenic laceration itself. And to me, when you have a combined flow medial wall fracture, traditionally it's a transconjunctival retrocurrencular followed by a transconjunctival inferior incision with the lateral canthotomy and cantholysis. But a lot of times now I'm able to do this with a pure inferior transconjunctival approach itself. So beginning surgeons, transconjunctival inferior plus medial transcurrencular or retrocurrencular incision with a cantholysis, but prevent, prevent implants, even floor medial wall implants uh, fractures can be easily fixed with a pure inferior transconjunctival approach is an example of one such patient. Bleeding, be aware, it's not just the arterial supply, but it's the venous return, which also keep to be kept to be important because you may actually miss this to intraoperatively and end up with a problem. Here's an example of a young boy who had a medial well fracture repair. You can see the translucent metaphor on CT scan, which is not very visible otherwise, transecting the anterior ethmoidal artery, causing a compartment syndrome. So that you had to go back and take out the implant, evacuate the hematoma, then reconstruct him. The other aspect that surgeons should be aware of is the implant dilemma. So choosing what implant, are you going to fixate it to the rim? Are you going to just put it along the floor in the medial wall? Here's an example of a patient who had a flow fracture repair down a silicone block, but the entire deformity was not addressed with persistent herniation and diplopia itself. So basically what implant we use to a very small fracture or crack fractures, you can probably put nothing or use sheet implants. But if you're using large fractures, you think about anatomical implants. And if you're doing complex revision surgeries and orbitofacial fractures, you think about patient-specific implants. So here are examples of where implant disasters are seen, partly because of poor visualization, poor technique, poor experience, and poor placement of implants itself. There's a whole variety of implants that's available. It's like going to a restaurant and eating off your menu. You cannot just be familiar with one dish and keep eating the same meal every day. And this is a new generation of patient-specific implants we are starting to use for complex revision fractures. How about post-operative complications? The worst is visual loss. Remember, it's real, okay? You can have either globe injuries, thankfully extremely uncommon, although a previously repaired globe can be disrupted. You can reopen the wound, but more often times it's vasculopathy or optic neuropathy. So be aware of compartment syndrome, retrobulbar hemorrhage, subperiosteal hemorrhage. Mr. Rose has talked about the devil's touch, and we've written a major paper on this concept itself, the various mechanism. It used to be thought as CRAO. It's not the CRAO, but actually it's the posterior ciliary arteries and the finer vessels which are innovating or are supplying the optic nerve, which usually the cause of visual loss. And learn to do a, not just a canthotomy and cantholysis, but a septolysis as well. But ideally, you want to be preventing these complications. Finally, touching about diplopia, this is the second most dreaded complication, iatrogenic complication itself, knowing the threshold to intervene. Remember, it's not just a muscle issue, but it's an intermuscular septum issue as well. And more traumatic the dissection you do within the orbit, or you incarcerate the intermuscular septum, not the muscle with your implants, can cause diplopia. 
here's an example of a patient who's got a simple flow fracture with entrapment and diplopia even after two weeks. We went and fixed him. We thought we did everything right. And look at him one week later, significant hypertropia, inferior rectus dysfunction. But because we were fairly confident, including the post-op imaging showing the implant is a normal place and force duction was intact, we had just ended up observing him and returned back to normal itself. So keep in mind that all not all diplopia are serious, but you do see these kind of patients who have visible diplopia, who are intolerant to phrenal presence, or they have a large ankle may require strabismus surgery. So in summary, there are numerous pitfalls. Orbital reconstruction can be quite challenging, but if you get it right and know fully well and you get enough experience and use all the technology that you have, it is very satisfying. Have a methodical preoperative evaluation, have a meticulous intraoperative surgical technique. Remember, people blame implants, it's not the implant often, very challenging, missing. And finally, every case is a learning case. Don't be uh, arrogant about your surgery itself. The first time is your best time. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful talk and also for accepting our invitation. Uh, really, it was an add-on to whatever Alan, sir, had just told us about. Uh, the house is open now for the discussion. Any comment from the panelist? I have a question, Dr. Sundar. Uh, I just would like to know, which would you prioritize as your successful outcome? Uh, would you attribute to an ophthalmis, uh, in ophthalmist correction, or would you attribute it to the diplopia correction? And what percentage of your cases would you uh, have a, uh, you know, diplopia free in ophthalmist free uh, situation? What percentage? Because a lot of us have uh, issues with being very uh, uh, precise in both these. Absolutely. Great question. I think all, like Dr. Allen mentioned, how much does it really affect these patients? In our own practice, we keep a slightly lower threshold for intervention because patients don't want to wait six weeks, two months to see whether the diplopia or their uh, enough thermos is going to get better or they can live with it. So provided they accept the risk and complications, they want to have their surgery done in a week or two, get back to the normal life and don't have to come back for follow-up. So in terms of diplopia of enough thalamus, I agree again, enough thalamus is much less significant than double vision. People who are motorcycle riders, people who are electricians, people who are playing pool, billiards, it depends on the activity and the quality of life. They probably would require intervention if you're able to show that the forced action test is positive and there's persistent, no change in angle of deviation or no change in improvement in motility of the eyes after a couple of weeks. I would use both as criteria, but of the two, diplopia will be a greater thing. And like retinal surgeons, we believe anatomical reconstruction, I think is very important. It's not just a matter of reducing whatever content you have and put an implant inside. We try to restore them as much as normal to back to the anatomical normal anatomy, flow, medial wall, lateral wall, whatever it takes. Thank you. I think I like your uh, uh, point about it's not the implant, it's the technique plus the uh, customization rather than just apply one rule for all. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Shai. Yeah. Dr. Sundar, uh, I have a talk. And uh, first of all, you have given a very comprehensive talk in very short time. So my compliment for that. Uh, my question is that when you intend to re-enter into the orbit uh, in presence of persistence of diplopia and also in presence of uh, a new diplopia developing after the surgery. Though you have touched upon one of those cases in your presentation. So in general, do you follow any principle for it? Or? I mean, if, I, if we just did one a couple of weeks ago, a patient was operated pre-pandemic. Uh, waited two years to get to us. Singapore finally managed to get in. We went back in for a persistent enough thalamus diplopia, an open globe injury patient just repaired with good vision restoration. We ended up removing four implants from the orbit. The implant was placed well below the posterior ledge and to support that displaced implant, somebody put three other implants below it to prop it up and stuff like that. So to me, when you have secondary postoperative diplopia where the primary implant is not in the right place, we believe in taking it all out, completely restoring not just the orbital fat, but whatever other tissue there is, including the infrabital neurovascular bundle, return it to the original anatomical position. And either we pre-bend and then one of these anatomical prefabricated plates, and now we have these PSIs. 
which is perfectly configured for the deformity and put it back in. Wait six weeks, three months, four months, whatever it is, and persistent diplopia, then you manage it in the second situation. So get your fracture back right again before you address it. Of course, if your implant is in the right place or is only slightly deviant and it's a minor and a residual strabismus and there's no enough thermos, then you can go ahead and address only strabismus in that direction. Okay. Sometime when we use large size implant, we do get post-operative diplopia, but slowly and slowly it tend to go away. But uh, I have seen in one of my patients, it has taken almost four months, but ultimately it went away. So uh, I only say the first trauma, the injury from causing the fracture is your first surgery the trauma. We surgeons, like Dr. Allen mentioned, cause the second trauma. And there are patients, sometimes they end up having a revision that ends up being the third trauma. I've had patients where they, somebody's gone into the orbit three or four times before they come to us. So imagine the multi multiplicity of trauma. Every subsequent trauma, it takes a little longer to recover. Thank you very much. So if there are no further questions, we can move to our next speaker. Uh, we have the recorded video of Dr. Geoffrey Rose. Uh, sir was not able to join us today because of prior commitments. I would like uh, the team, AV team, to please share the recorded video of Sir's lecture. Thank you very much for asking me to speak. And I would like to detail the giant fornix syndrome or how to spend 10 minutes learning about an important condition that may well save many an eye. So, the giant fornix syndrome, how is it recognized? Well, in the 1990s, I saw a few very elderly patients who were referred with gross chronic conjunctivitis and lacrimal drainage obstruction, like this patient. Most had some degree of ptosis, often worse on the affected side. And here was a typical sort of patient, and when you looked, they had an absolutely filthy eye with a big mucus seal. And at that time, I thought it was the toxic debris causing this problem with the cornea vascularization. It was just toxicity of the surface debris. Well, these patients would undergo successful and uncomplicated external DCR and with complete elimination of the lacrimal sac mucus seal. So there was no more debris to come back into the eye. After improving for a few days to a few weeks, the condition would actually then return to what it was before. And so what was going on here? I really couldn't make this out. Looking at the patients after DCR one day, I noted that one of the patients had a huge protein coagulum like a fried egg lodged deeply in the upper fornix and you can just see the tip of the coagulum there very hard to illustrate because it's a very long way up and lots and lots of pus and debris around the protein coagulum when you removed it always cultures staphylococcus aureus and the presence of this coagulum leads to a very severe quite often hemorrhagic conjunctival reaction bacteria and the toxins within the coagulum are pouring onto the ocular surface. So how does this condition occur? Well, I present a hypothetical mechanism based on the work that I have done. First of all, these patients probably start with a severe chronic conjunctivitis due to the bacteria and debris in the tear film. This causes ocular surface irritation and pseudomembrane formation due to the protein exudation into the tear lake. This then coagulates to form a bacterial laden protein coagulum, which lodges itself in a very large upper fornix. That coagulum then keeps persistently re-inoculating the ocular surface with low-grade bacteria. It forms a Petri dish 
putting bacteria onto the front of the eye. And these bacteria in turn keep fueling the chronic conjunctivitis, so you get a positive feedback loop. A large lacrimal sac mucosal in these patients may well have been the initial early chronic infection in patients who are liable to form this positive feedback loop. The chronic inflammation and debris leads to an increase in conjunctival surface area due to papillary response and redundant conjunctival folds. And these in turn will give greater area for protein exudation and also more spaces in which you can develop a protein coagulum. As we get older, the upper fornix does get deeper with age due to disinsertion of the levator upon neurosis. So it, it's a, particularly a problem with elderly people who will get this huge upper fornix that can collect the coagulum. And the chronic severe ocular surface inflammation worsens the ptosis in these patients. And that in turn also deepens the upper fornix. So what are the characteristics of the giant fornix syndrome, which I described back about 20 years ago now? Well, I had 12 patients, of whom 10 were female. They're aged 77 to 93, so they're all in their ninth and 10th decade. And these patients typically had lots of episodes of severe conjunctivitis over anything from one to four years. It often passed unrecognized for long periods, and indeed, I didn't recognize it in the early days. I thought it was all down to the lacrimal sac mucosal, um, and it was only when you had persistent problems after a successful DCR that I wondered what was going on. What is the importance of this condition? Well, it has major visual morbidity. Nine out of the 12 patients that were referred had severe corneal vascularization due to the extreme toxicity and the cytokines and the vasoactive agents that were secreted in this toxic tear lake. And in eight of those patients, the acuity was counting fingers or less when they were finally referred to me. The second area of importance is that there is major ocular morbidity associated in that it is so toxic that you get corneal melting and five of the 12 patients had spontaneous corneal perforation or decimetoseal, as here you can see the decimetoseal. So how do we treat the giant fornix syndrome? Well, in many patients in the UK, they can't treat themselves effectively at home. They're far too elderly. And so we may admit them for a day or two. We then treat them with hourly potent steroids to quieten the inflammatory response and two hourly anti-staphylococcal agent. We will also give them systemic ciprofloxacin for five days because these highly inflamed surfaces settle much faster with a bit of systemic antibiotic. And in some cases, if there's a lot of coagulum formation, you can sweep the upper fornix with a amethacane, tetracaine soaked cotton bud two or three times daily to remove the coagulum. You only need to do this for a day or two. Long term, these patients, you should tail down the topical treatment very, very slowly over weeks to months. They have had such severe inflammation that if you suddenly top, stop the topical treatment, you will get a recurrence of the disease. You may need to perform lacrimal drainage surgery if there is a mucosal. And it may be necessary to continue the once daily dosage for topical antibiotic steroid preparation, for example, at night, long term, because these patients with their large fornix are liable to relapse at some stage. The alternative is to use once daily polyvidone iodine 5% eye drops. Again, they're used at night, it's a good time to use them. And some patients who have an abnormally large fornix and really don't settle, one can consider resecting 
some of the upper fornix conjunctiva. So in summary, when you see this sort of patient with a filthy eye, ptosis, elderly patient, they've already got an aponeurosis disinsertion, but it's markedly increased on the side where it's mucky and huge ptosis and an ocular surface that is looking extremely filthy. Think giant fornix syndrome, think giant fornix syndrome, and you will save the patients ending up with visions down at count fingers and so on, and the severe complications like perforation. Thank you very much, everyone. So uh, that was the recorded lecture video by Dr. Rose. So I could not join us. Uh, if there are any comments from the panelists, the house is open for discussion. Uh, well, it's, uh, I think, uh, a good thing to keep in our mind. My only concern with this is that the use of early steroid in presence of staph aureus infection and early prednisolone in presence of a staph aureus infection and compromised cornea. So maybe, uh, I don't know, like uh, I would rather go with soft steroids and that too not so frequently in this particular condition. Uh, Dr. Grover, what do you take on it? So personal experience with this entity, I think um, I've been educated. I have not really diagnosed this condition ever before. So I would like to now observe more closely and see um, and diagnose this condition before I really can make a comment on this. All right. Wondering about one point. Um, does it is it because of the deep phonics he likes to call it as a giant phonics syndrome? Is it just because of that? Because we do see our cases, even severe allergic conjunctivitis with uh, 360 limbal vascularization, slowly going in for uh, corneal decompensation. And very many a time, we hardly there's any role for antibiotics. We have to resort to FML, that is uh, steroids, sorry. We will have, and sometimes even long term, and we have to keep them under close watch. So otherwise, they'll go for a corneal breakdown, as you shown. Maybe at that point of time, does the infection set in? I really want to know, is it because it's all happening in the phonics and the phonics is deep because of the clinical photographs which were shown were all having a very deep sulcus. Yeah, madam. And all those cases were unilateral actually. Yes. So the problem of allergy would create bilateral problem. And uh, the other thing is that he said that uh, staph aureus infection was there in all. So it is really a distinct, I think, clinical uh, entity we can say. But yes, I can also now recollect, we do see such cases where the eye is boggy kind of thing and full with pus. So, but what we do is we give broad spectrum antibiotics sometime with the low dose steroids and patient do get treated. But yes, we do see cases like this. Maybe now we'll be more wiser and we'll cap keep a regular yeah. check on these cases. And that too, here with most of the parents staying alone here with children away abroad and those who are staying in assisted living and in uh, tertiary, in, 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 um, in hospices and all that, I think this will be a problem to watch out for. Yeah, I think as Mukesh said, um, the unilaterality is the key. Otherwise, we would be thinking of an ocular cicatricial pemphigoid or... Um, other entities with, with chronic inflammation, either um, bacterial or, or um, bacterioallergic. Here again, I think bacterioallergic component, possibly the staph allergic component is playing a key role in the keratitis. The classical marginal keratitis, sometimes we notice, is more central as well. So possibly the infiltrates in cornea may be... Um, maybe a bacterial allergic in addition to the bacterial itself, which goes on to thinning and uh, causing the perforation as well as, as uh, 
and as dr jeff uh, so nicely yes, pointed yes that's out. a very valid point and i think that will be the take home message from this particular talk what you have just mentioned is the take home message <clears throat> thank you so uh, now i would like to invite our next speaker that's an international he's an international luminary from india and he is uh, none other than our editor of igo igo and our favorite speaker dr santosh unavar sir sir will be talking about the oncological principles for an oculoplasty surgeon over to you sir thank you so much kunjan thank you for the opportunity are my slides seen uh yes sir they are visible all right so i'll be talking about uh, oncological principles for an oculoplasty surgeon it's important because about 50% of tumors of the ocular surface eyelid and orbit presenting to an oculoplasty surgeon can be malignant with impending risk to life eye and vision salvage let's start with ocular surface tumors uh, it's important to understand when not to use topical therapy in ocular surface tumors and when we perform surgery to make sure to obtain edge and base clearance and when we plan adjuvant treatment it should be histopathology guided and not random and also screen for regional lymphoid metastasis and be aware of target therapy when diagnosis is in doubt you should never use topical therapy this looks like ocular surface squamous neoplasia but look at the patient's face he has unilateral red eye and when we flip the lid we find that the lid margin is thickened there is rounding of the posterior lid margin meibomian gland orifices are all lost so it's pejetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma where topical therapy may not work at all when you're not sure about the stage again you should not use topical therapy oculoplasty surgeons tend to read the abstracts and some of them treat the patient with disastrous consequences like this patient had oasis and was treated with topical treatment and the patient has obviously worsened so they should read the small print that in patients who have t3 disease it doesn't just mean that there is a superficial lesion but there might be a lesion which involves cornea intraocular structures fornicial conjunctiva etc so not cross staging but go into the details of the staging and then decide if you really want to treat that patient with topical therapy coming to edge and base clearance in surgery the principle is to excise the tumor with 4 mm clinically clear margins which means that you should have stain the tumor with rose bengal determine the clinical margins under slit lamp by microscopy draw a large picture or use a digital photograph intraoperatively to determine the margins intraoperatively after having given a block sometimes the margins become indistinguishable and for the corneal epithelial component use alcohol assisted keratoepithelial epithelectomy and resection edge should be cryo twice over edge is easy to determine this is a rose bengal stain tumor you can see that the edge is quite clear beyond that you go for millimeter on all sides and for the corneal epithelial component you do alcohol assisted keratoepithelectomy but for the base you have to do either anterior segment oct or ubm otherwise this patient where corneal stroma is already involved could not have been detected at all if you had not used imaging and surgical excision is definitely not the treatment of choice for this patient so patients who have scleral invasion or corneal stromal invasion need to be additionally treated not by sclerectomy or lamellar keratectomy but by plaque brachytherapy which can be eye and vision saving as you see here adjuvant therapy should not be guided by guess there is a habit among oculoplasty surgeons and even corneal specialists to provide topical 5-fluoroacetyl or mitomycin following excision it should rather be guided by histopathology this is the protocol that is supposed to be followed for adjuvant therapy when resection edge is positive and it has only carcinoma in situ or dysplasia then if you have already performed cryotherapy then you can simply observe but if you have not performed edge cryotherapy then topical chemotherapy or topical immunotherapy would be appropriate if resection edge is positive and it has invasive squamous cell carcinoma we know that invasive squamous cell carcinoma does not respond to topical therapy so well so we have to re-excise it if resection base is positive and the pathologist can localize the base to a particular clock hour then you can do cryotherapy and closely observe the patient but if the resection base is positive and it is diffuse positivity or the clock hour cannot be discerned easily by the pathologist then plaque brachytherapy would be logical 
If margins and base are negative, but the patient is prone to recurrence, such as patient with xeroderma pigmentosum or HIV seropositivity, then immunomodulation once a day dose of interferon may help. For patients who have a large tumor, then you might want to do PET CT scan of head and neck or sentinel node biopsy, especially in patients who have conjunctival melanoma. We should know the role of target therapy specifically in conjunctival melanoma. Mutational spectrum has all been worked out and for each mutation, we have a specific target therapy. Literature is appearing showing use, usefulness of certain target therapeutic agents such as pembrolizumab, which was able to resolve this extra large uh, extension of a melanoma, conjunctival melanoma, anterior orbital extension. We have literature on neulumab, and this is our own patient where the patient had regional lymph node extension for which neulumab was indicated. He also had subtle ocular surface recurrence as well, which responded completely to systemic lumab, nivolumab, and the patient had complete re regression of the ocular surface recurrence as well. So this is something that may be useful. For eyelid tumors, the oncological principles are intraoperative margin control and for sebaceous gland carcinoma to exclude intraepithelial tumor by doing MAP biopsy. Multimodal treatment should be used in advanced tumors and we also have to screen these patients for regional lymph node metastasis. There's a role for target therapy as well. In sebaceous gland carcinoma, it is important to mark the edges very carefully, both on the skin side as well on, as on the cunning table side because in sebaceous gland carcinoma, the tarsal conjunctival component may be much larger than what is visible on the skin. Intraoperative margins are sent to the pathologist while the patient waits under anesthesia or if you're doing under local anesthesia, waits for reconstruction. And once the margins are received as negative, then you proceed with reconstruction. In patients with sebaceous gland carcinoma, it is ideal to perform MAP biopsy from 17 sites lay it on a filter paper, mark each num each of the locations and send it to the pathologist so that we rule out pejetoid invasion. For patients who have a much larger tumor of this sort with anterior orbital extension, they all don't deserve orbital ex excentration. This patient has responded very well to chemo reduction. You can see the residual tumor involves only the medial two-thirds of the lower lid now. The orbital component is all gone, thus amenable to local excision. This was a patient with lacrimal sac sebaceous gland carcinoma, a very unusual variant where somebody had already done a DCR, letting the cat out of the bag. There is an intranasal extension as well. But the patient has 6 6 vision and we wanted to save the eye. And that was possible with chemo reduction, dacrocystectomy, and stereotactic radiation. We have uh, for basal cell carcinoma, especially target therapy in the form of vismodigib and sonidigib. This is for syndromic variant of basal cell carcinoma. The same treatment can now be used, used for orbital extension as well. For squamous cell carcinoma, where the patient may be inoperable because of systemic, le systemic uh, uh, reasons, now can be stabilized and controlled, and the patient can be symptomatically made to feel better by using epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors such as erlotinib. In orbital tumors, complete excision of a well-circumscribed tumor is the oncological principle irrespective of the fact that clinically it may be malignant or benign. If it's well circumscribed, we would rather excise. For patients who have uh, uh, infiltrative lesion, incisional biopsy is warranted or safe debulking with intraoperative diagnosis. That should be followed by histopathology guided adjuvant treatment and there's a role for multimodal treatment as well. In incisional biopsy, the principles are direct approach and multimodal biopsy. This is a patient with adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland where a lid crease incision was used and an incisional biopsy had been performed, but unfortunately, bone was also cut by the prior surgeon. Now, the patient has recurrence all over the extent of the eyelid, nodular recurrences, and there is extension of the tumor into the temporal fossa as well. So whenever you perform incisional biopsy, specifically for lacrimal gland tumors, there has to be a direct approach without a flap so that even if there is seeding that is localized, and that area could be included in, in the field of radiation. We should also know about the way of performing incisional biopsy because about 20% of orbital biopsies result in misleadingly wrong diagnosis because of unrepresentative sample, non-uniform pathology, especially in lymphoproliferative lesions, and also tissue reaction. This was a young child with an orbital mass, most likely rhabdomyosarcoma, and we have a protocol of performing biopsy from multiple areas right to the epicenter of the lesion, and we have access to these tissues. 
from the superficial biopsy from zone which is very close to the periosteum we found only inflammation and fibrosis that was tissue reaction in the mid zone and deep biopsy we found the tumor rhabdomyosarcoma which was embryonal so if we were to confine ourselves to only a superficial biopsy in this patient our misdiagnosis would be orbital inflammation so you should remember that uh, tumors may have uh, variable pathology in variable in uh, different parts of the lesion especially in round cell tumors there could be tumor necrosis and tissue reaction in the periphery of the tumor and lymphoproliferative lesions have a tendency to have benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia atypical lymphoid hyperplasia and lymphoma in the same lesion in different parts so multi level biopsy is warranted right up to the epicenter of the lesion there is a role for intraoperative diagnosis as well patients who have extensive lesions like this it's ideal to perform a biopsy from a safe location do an intraoperative diagnosis and proceed with debulking or uh, near total excision only if it is not amenable to systemic therapy or for the local therapy this was a patient with eosinophilic granuloma and all we needed to inject was triamcinolone with consequent complete bone remodeling one more similar patient histopathology guided adjuvant therapy is indicated especially in solitary fibrous tumors this was a patient where there was no cellular atypia no adjuvant treatment was given over this patient also had sft but had cellular atypia and mitotic activity for which uh, adjuvant radiotherapy was warranted in orbital lymphoma not all patients need to be treated with external beam radiation this patient had an anteriorly located lymphoma and was a professional and had wanted minimal morbidity so this patient could be safely treated with rituximab with minimal side effects and no ocular complications oculoplasty surgeons also tend to perform orbital excentration more often than not but we should understand that orbital excentration just that without any adjuvant therapy may have a high risk of mortality so it's important that we consider adjuvant chemotherapy especially in patients who have a possibility of micrometastasis which can come up several years later so adjuvant chemotherapy biologicals or target therapy for patients with stratification of risk is warranted in multimodal treatment we perform biopsy to confirm confirm the uh, diagnosis then chemo reduce the tumor then do a n block excision and deliver stereotactic radiation and that works very well for adenoid cystic carcinoma with much improved outcome so in conclusion i would say that adherence to oncological principles optimizes life eye and vision salvage in patients with tumors of the ocular surface eyelid and orbit thank you so much So uh, the house is open for discussion. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful talk. There were really some basic points which one should keep in mind while dealing with the patients with ocular oncology. Uh, I would like to have the opinion of uh, the other panelists who have joined us. I would I would like to make a comment. I think every point that Dr. Hanavar made is important, but one of the most important points was when. When evaluating a patient with an orbital mass, it is, it, I think it is not appropriate to take an incisional biopsy. I think if you can completely resect the mass, as he indicated, you might save the patient multiple surgeries. And I'll give you four examples that we have. We've seen four young patients now who've had incisional biopsy of, quote, pleomorphic adenoma of the lacrimal gland and all four of these patients, this is over the past four or five years, all four of the patients have had seeding all over their orbit, and two of them came to exoneration, one to multiple surgeries and radiotherapy. So if you're looking at a lacrimal gland mass or really any tumor in the orbit, and it, it is completely resectable, please do complete resection. Uh. One question, Dr. Honawar, I would like to ask. Uh, you said four millimeter clear mar healthy margin. Uh, you follow this rule in OSSN also. But uh, really, sometimes it is very difficult to have a four millimeter healthy margin for OSSN. For LID, obviously, we can uh, follow this rule. But for OSSN also, for, what is your take on it? Uh, because yeah. I uh, remember Dr. Carroll saying two millimeter healthy margin for that. 
Well, I mean, we had actually done a study where we uh, kind of analyzed all of our OSSN and uh, got risk factors for local tumor recurrence. And what stood out was margin positivity. And the chance of having margin positivity would be higher if you were to take anything less than four millimeter. So we meticulously take four millimeter margins on the conjunctival side and do alcohol assisted keratoepithelectomy for the corneal epithelial component, lay it flat on a filter paper and send it to the pathologist. With four millimeter margins, the chance of getting margin positivity is negligible. It is close to zero. So you have a much better chance of not having local tumor recurrence and not having to provide adjuvant treatment if you have to take four millimeter. Well, you can say, you know, anywhere between two to four is okay, but I would prefer four millimeter based on my past experience and my data. And sometimes if you're operating temporally where you have a lot of tissue for reconstruction, you can go four millimeters and not worry. When you're medially on the conjunctiva, then you, you know, the wider you go, the more you have to use an amniotic graft. And the, the other point I'd like to even further underscore that Dr. Hanavar made was, if you have margin involvement with squamous neoplasia, you can treat with topical therapy. But if you have margin involvement with conjunctival melanoma, you have to go back in. There's, there's no topical therapy that's going to treat conjunctival melanoma. We treat it much more aggressively than we do squamous neoplasia. I am impressed. It's a disaster if you have a margin positivity in a melanoma or invasive squamous cell carcinoma. If you don't resect and the patient unfortunately has a recurrence, that is a right case for, you know, to be sued. Yeah. A comment and a question. Yeah. Um, I agree with Dr. Carol Shields that even if you have orbital rhabdomyosarcoma, if you can get away with taking it all out as much as possible rather than just doing a simple incision biopsy, residual tumor volume makes a big difference in how you're going to be treating these with high dose radiation versus diffuse radiation versus localized radiation. So I tend to do that as well, not just do an incision biopsy. The question I have is related to solitary fibrous tumors, which can be quite challenging as well. Sometimes they go all the way up to the apex. And every once in a while, we are left with 10, 20% left behind in the orbit itself. How do you monitor these in the absence of mitosis and ATPI in the resected specimens uh, from all of you experts? For residual SFT, irrespective of if there is mitosis or not, they tend to grow back fairly rapidly. The speed may be different in different patients, but they do grow back. And if they grow back towards the superior orbital fissure or orbital apex, then you'll have disastrous consequences. So irrespective of whether there is cellular ATP or mitotic activity or not, if there is a residual tumor, we generally tend to treat them with radiation. If there is no residual tumor, then obviously you can watch if there is no cellular ATP. Yeah, I would agree. We just operated this week Yes, uh, two days ago, on a patient who had SFT, solitary fibrous tumor. Santosh probably remembers this patient. This patient had his first surgery with Dr. Jerry Shields about 15 years ago. It was resected. It took about eight years to come back. Then Dr. Sarah Lally and I operated on him eight years ago, and it took another eight years to come back. They always come back and we tell these patients, um, it's going to be back probably in eight to 10 years. And if you want to reduce the risk for it to recur, we can give radiotherapy. Some people don't want the radiotherapy. And the other point of how much can you leave, you know, on our recent surgery, just two days ago, um, we took everything out. I am worried that we damaged his inferior rectus muscle. And, you know, we just warned the family, this is, this is S SFT. It was in the muscular capsule and we had to make the decision. Do you leave that little residua and radiate or do you just go for broke and get it out? And we, we removed it. And I worry that he's going to have muscle abnormalities. And that that's actually moderately common in these patients. They have so much surgery, so much scarring. Thank you. Could I ask the panel um, what their current preference is for pagetoid spread in sebaceous carcinoma? Currently, I'll do three cycles of mod topical mitomycin, and then if there's recurrence after that, 
you know, I, I monitor them six months later, usually we'll do uh, map biopsies. And if there's recurrence, how would they treat it then? Localized. Yeah, if it's localized, if it's amenable to cryotherapy, then uh, cryotherapy is a good option. Posterior laminar resection is a good option if it's palpable conjunctival involvement. Of course, mitomycin we all use and has about 50% chance that it, it works, not in all patients. What about yeah, and I'd like, to, I'd like to highlight uh, an article that was published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology by our team. We looked at sebaceous carcinoma treated with, quote, lumpectomy, where you just remove the tumor and you hope it wasn't at the margins versus posterior lamellar resection. And we found significantly less recurrence with posterior lamellar resection, less need for exoneration and less multiple therapies. So I think when you do a posterior lamellar resection from the start, you're gonna reduce your rate of tumor recurrence compared to lumpectomy. And I also agree with Dr. Hanavar, when we see pagetoid invasion, we go in, we do map biopsies, just as uh, Dr. Allen and Dr. Hanavar talked about today. And we cryo the entire bulbar fornicele and tarsal conjunctiva. It takes, you know, 30 minutes to cryo the whole conjunctiva in hopes that we got rid of all pagetoid invasion, not knowing where it is. And then we bring the patient back in six months and remap them to see where it is and re-cryo them all over again. We feel cryotherapy is more robust against pagetoid compared to mitomycin C, but no one's ever done a, a comparative analysis. We like cryotherapy. So we, we cryo not knowing where it is, but our map biopsies tells us where it is two weeks after our cryo. Dr. Carol, I have a question for you. Dr. Santosh, go yeah. ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just talking about a newer form of treatment that's on the horizon, uh, which is a plaque brachytherapy, which is in the shape of a similar front ring. And both the sides are uh, covered with, coated with ruthenium. So you can treat the palpable conjunctiva and the entire bulbar conjunctiva at the same time. So that's something useful for pejetoid cervicus scan cast. Yeah, this is for Dr. Carol and Dr. Uh, Hunawa. Uh, regarding the uh, risk of systemic metastasis, uh, when you compare nodular sebaceous gland carcinoma to pegetoid carcinoma, how would you uh, rate it? With higher uh, pegetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma de definitely has, not systemic, I would say, but regional implant metastasis is substantially higher with pegetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma as compared to even larger size, more than 10 millimeter nodular variant. And nodular variant with remote pegetoid extension, which is not around the lesion, but remote, has a higher chance of regional lymph node metastasis. Not so much as systemic metastasis. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would say years ago, we published a report. I think the lead author was Aning, A-N-I-N-G, Chow, C-H-A-O. And do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> and we looked at cool patients with pagetoid versus non-pagetoid sebaceous carcinoma. And I think the, the only outcome that was really significantly different was pagetoid sebaceous carcinoma had a greater risk for exoneration. Okay. But that was before we had a lot of these, you know, heavy cryotherapy, MAP biopsies and all the stuff we're doing now. Thank you. Antosh, I have a question for you. Uh, supposing you use a simbliferon ring-shaped plaque, would you land up over-treating because it will be covering the upper phonics, the lower phonics? Yeah, it is a, it, yes, of course, it, you can use it for patients who have all the map biopsies positive, or we can customize it. We, if you use That's iodine right. seeds, okay. if you use iodine seeds, it can be customized to that particular quadrant where the tumor is located or a particular area of the conjunctiva or clock covers where the tumor is located. Okay, thank you. I was expecting that. So we use something similar to that. We use a conformer plaque and Dr. Hanavar and Dr. Farooz know of this. It's, it's a conformer like you put in the eye after a nucleation and it has radioactive I-125 seeds to irradiate diffuse melanoma or diffuse uh, pagetoid sebaceous carcinoma. It, it, so it works. Um, patients do get a lot of secondary radiation complications. 
Carol, in the simplifidon ring will have an advantage of sparing the cornea. But if you use a conformer shaped uh, plaque overnight, wouldn't you land up uh, compromising the cornea? Because I've seen once or twice in the past, if we left the cornea, if the if we left the conformer overnight, the next day the cornea would definitely show changes. Does it hold good for the plaque also? Yes. So the plaque has seeds, and this it's an, a non shielded conformer plaque, so it can irradiate the tarsal and the ball bar conjunctiva. And we place a, a prochera ring over yep. the cornea and then put the plaque right on top of that. And we don't put radiation on the cornea. The radiation only goes to the fornix. This is where a symblephron ring is kind of yes. nice because there's nothing over the That's cornea. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Carroll, uh, talking about the radiation over the cornea. I mean, when I was there with you, you remember the patient with the anterior segment retinoblastoma where we actually have to place the plaque on the cornea to treat the retinoblastoma. And she yeah. had excellent vision. You know, it never affected yeah. the cornea and even the endothelial deposits of uh, tumor cells. It completely yeah. Uh, yeah, melted away. Yeah, I have to say we irradiate iris melanoma, iris metastasis, retinoblastoma in the anterior segment with plaque right on the cornea. And in 90% of cases, the cornea remains happy. 10% of cases, it becomes edematous. Thank you. So are there any further comments? Uh, if there are no further comments, then we can move to our next speaker. Our next speaker is from Guwahati. Uh, uh, she is the director of Sri Shankara Deva Nitrale Guwahati. Uh, she is Dr. Kasturi Bhattacharji. Uh, Ma'am will be discussing about a very interesting topic, and that is her experiences in management of congenitally malformed uh, sockets, which is one of the difficult aspects to tackle. Uh, Ma'am, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gunjan. Thank you, AIOS. And thank you, Dr. Namrata, for having me in this meeting. In fact, Gunjan, when you have asked me for the topic, that day I was doing a challenging case, and all of a sudden I have given you this topic. Now I wonder like, how many cases I have. And whatever little experience I have, I would like to share with each one of you. So I'll be speaking on tackling the congenitally malformed socket. What is my management perspective? So when we talk about the congenital malformed socket, we know that it can occur either in isolation or as a part of a larger systemic malformation. Many a times they have severely impaired vision. Sometimes they come with only cosmetic aberration. And sometimes the patient are not even aware of it and it can be noted on a routine eye examination. It can be broadly classified into three categories. The first and the commonest is a localized anomaly to the orbit in the form of microphthalmus or anophthalmus. Second being the facial clefting syndrome. And the third, the craniosynostosis. And the fourth, the non-specific congenital orbit and anomalies. And there's a huge list to us, but we, what we commonly encounter is basically the fibrous dysplasia. And in this talk, I'll basically restrict to the first three. So whenever we talk about the localized anomalies of the orbit, the common ones are the microphthalmus or anophthalmus, and this can be managed very well with enucleation. Like if you can see, this is uh, eyeball along with the cyst, and with a simple procedure like enucleation, where you remove the eyeball, you remove the cyst, and you do a very educate place, a very educate implant, and you can have a very good implant, prosthesis motility, as you can see here. But whenever you have something like a congenital anophthalmus, this is a little more challenging because you know, it is not possible to put an implant in such situation. So in such cases, what we do, we go for a dermis fed graft. And the advantage of dermis fed graft is a very, very good volume expander. So what we do, we go to the side and the, if we can fashion four flaps or whatever tissue is remaining, and then we suture the dermis fat graph in this four of the fibrovascular flap, there is a possibility of some amount of improved, I mean, motility of the prosthesis. And usually in such situations, sometimes I do put an amniotic membrane so that it heals up very well. And this, these are the results that you can see pre-op, and this is a week post-op, and this is approximately a few months following the surgery. But when you have the second syndromes, that is the 
facial clefting. Sorry, I have a bad throat today. So these are the uh, clefting syndrome, which KCR has um, described very well that most of the soft tissue defect, they are associated with the underlying bony defect. So when you have something simple like this, that this you have a TCS 11, where you have basically a type of coloboma. So it can be managed very well with tissue mobilization. Being a female, what we want to give, we want to give the eyelashes. So a tissue mobilization in the form of a tensile flap works very well. As you can see in the small child, pre-operative a week and almost one month following the surgery. But again, when you have something more, uh, more of a defect like this, a TCS 10 and 11, and they also, the parents also want that we need eyelashes. So in such situation, the tensile is not working because it's a very big crab. So what I have done, I have switched tissue from the lower it's lead to the upper lead in order to give an eyelash. And this is what you can see post-operative. You can see a few eyelashes in this child. But what about the TCS4? When you have a soft tissue defect with an underlying bony defect, when the underlying bony defect is not very severe, in those situations, what you can do, you can do only tissue mobilization and you, you can do only a soft tissue repair, as you can see here. But when you have a situation like this with a very big bony defect, so these are the situation where you need to do a repair, you need to, re, I mean, reform the defect, the bony defect, and the best way is by taking a electrolysis graft. And we all know that electrolysis uh, graft is a gold standard for when we do a bony defect. And because it has a very high osteogenity being a cancellous bone, it gives a really good bony repair. But what I have learned that when I was doing the surgery and when I have seen the post-operative, I had done a good bony re uh, defect, repair of the bony defect, but the soft tissue is usually missing out here. As you can see here, the soft tissue defect was not done in the same city. So what I have done, I have modified like this is again, you can see a TCS3 and a TCL4. When, when you look to this child, you can see that there is a big bony defect. You can see there's hardly a bone out here. So in this situation, what I have done, I have done a both simultaneously a soft tissue repair also with the underlying bony defect. So when you see this child out here, when you see this patient out here with a big bony defect here, so what I had done, first I had made an incision in the area of this soft tissue and the bony defect. This is a TCS 3 and 4, as you can see here. And then the first, um, at first I tried to collect the soft tissue defect. And when I have opened up, you can see there's hardly any bone. So how did I manage the soft tissue correction? This is which, uh, by remove this fibrous tissue in the columnometers area. And then once it has been removed, a tensile flap has been created. So this is the tensile that I have been created. And also then I try to pull and see what is the maximum amount of pull and that I can do. And when you repair, the most important is this uh, lead, I mean the margin suture. And this is based on what I do with the far far near near suture. So once this is being done and this defect, the soft tissue defect has been closed and the repair of the tensile. And now I'm creating a new lateral canthus. So I'm taking the suture along with the bite of the periosteum so that I can do a very adequate refashioning of the lateral canthus. So you can see earlier suture, suturing of this soft tissue um, has been done. And the next is how do I close this bony defect? As I've already mentioned that this bony defect can be done very well by the elite crest craft. Advantage of this area that you also can use this dermis fat as, uh, I mean, the craft to, I mean, treat the soft tissue defect. So. The dermis fat has been taken, and now you make your incision over the periosteum. And this is like um, one of the easiest graft to be taken because it is easily accessible, number one. And also, it is being a cancellous bone. Even if you don't use a saw, you can also use a direct 15 blade and you can make an incision. Different ways, some people take only the cancellous part of it, but usually I prefer, I prefer to take a cortical cancellous part to it. And then with the splitter, once it's uh, split it and you take this bone and you place and you try to fashion it to mold into the soft tissue area. But the most important for any bony graft, there should be a, I mean, edge to edge bony contact and we should prevent its mobilization or I mean dislodgement later. So I usually put a titanium plate and a titanium screw. And the soft tissue part that the dermis fat that I have harvested from the same area that is being placed over the bony defect. 
And now I need to cover this uh, soft tissue part, I mean, the um, uh, dermis fed graft. And, you know, I feel that this nasolabial flap, it really works good because we know that the facial artery has got lots of branches and lots of supply. It really keeps the underlying tissue very viable. So I have fashioned a nasolabial flap. And then once the dermis fed graft has been placed, you can see the nasolabial flap has been fashioned. And then this is being used to cover this soft tissue defect. So I have an uh, underlying bony graft over that. I have a soft tissue advantage of this bone because it has a bony context. So the bone graft takes up well. And the soft tissue, the most advantage of it is that you also have a flap over it, which gives a good supply. And this is what you see the, in the immediate a week, just after removing the patch, you can usually see the steep mark out here. And this is a picture he had sent me after a month. And this is not a very good picture but because it has been taken by his system. And then the third being the craniosynostosis, where we know the most common is a Crohn's disease, which presents with removing the patch. You can usually see the steep mark out here. And this is a picture which occurs in one in 25,000 live birth. It can occur in the single member of the family or it can also have a genetic component. You can see the mother and the child both with a Crohn's disease having both the ocular and systemic manifestation best managed by the neurosurgeon by strip craniectomy or with a lipo 3 osteotomy with the distraction osteogenesis. But the distraction osteogenesis, you need to keep the distractors for more than six months. It may be supplemented by other surgery, but what can an ophthalmologist do when a situation comes like this here, you need to salvage the eyes, salvage the vision. This total luxation bulb, and you can see there's so much of exposure keratopathy. The child is in extreme pain, and even by safe method, if you try to push back, it will not go inside. So I need to save the vision for which, and, and when you look to this, I mean, the CT scan out here of the same child, you can see the bronze beaten or the uh, copper beaten appearance, and also you can see the absence of the coronal suture. And so I have developed my innovative uh, I mean, technique. So if you look to this skull here, which is a classical, the clover leaf um, skull that we see in Cruzon, what I had done, I had done an orbital malar advancement, putting a bony contact so that the bone does not undergo necrosis and superiorly like the way we do for the thyroid decompression, a some amount of decompression has been done in order to make space for the globe to go inside. This is same in the lateral view. You can see a orbitomalar advancement has been done and bony contact has been kept. To place the bone in position, I have used the platinum plate and the screw. Some amount of decompression has been done in the superior wall in order to push back the globe. And this is the surgery that you can see this of the same child, where you can see a lateral cantotomy, cantolysis has been done, a middle incision has been given. And once we have given the incision, I tried to expose the whole of the maxilla. This is once the whole of the maxilla has been exposed, you can see, and you can see it's a very soft bone because she's not even one year and also that you can see this are the infrabital blood vessels. This is the entire part of the maxilla. And some amount of bleed that has been controlled with the bone wax, as you can see here. And then the marking has been done. I tried to make a mark. And what is my plan? That I need to advance it, like the orbital malar advancement, so that you can push the globe back. So this is what I tried in this patient. And I had done only two patients, and you can see. And this is the incision. And since it's a soft bone, it can be cut very well with a saw that you can see here. This is on the anterior part of the maxilla. <clears throat> Same has been done on the orbited part. And once it has been part, then this has been moved entirely. But one main point to be remember then whenever we do any manipulation with any of the bones, if we have a bony contact, the chance of bone undergoing necrosis is less. And once this has been split and we have that, and you can see I'm keeping a bony contact out here and to keep in position a titanium plate and the titanium screw has been used. So once the lower orbital wall has been, uh, I mean, refashioned, what I do now, I'm doing some amount of decompression in the superior part of the orbit. And this will also, once I decompress, which is the same way what we do for a kind of decompression. And once this is being done, and this is being followed by the closure in layers. So this is a child, you can see a uh, 10 days after release of the tarsorophy suture. And this is a child, now she is so much in peace, like she's listening to songs in her mother's mobile. And then this is a child, when she looks down, you can see the eye does not come out, there's no luxatia bulbi. And this is the same child after five years now, she has started going to the school. 
And this is the pre-op and you can see the post-op. The most important, the posterior cleavage and the posterior bone contact that you can see in this very early three weeks CT scan. And this is her post-operative where you can see the increase in the vertical diameter from 19 millimeter to 31 millimeter, as you can see here. <coughs> and also this is the area of the superior decompression. And you see the orbital malar angle. This is a preoperative and there's a postoperative. And you can see this expansion of the orbit and you can see. And now if we compare her, this is a five years postoperative. And I feel so happy when she had sent, she had sent this to me. And you can see now she has started going to school and she takes part in the school program. So what is the advantage when I have gone back to my surgery? I have realized that this is a one-time surgery and it buys time for other major surgery in case you want to do it a later half. And this advantage that there's a less chance of infection because the distractors are not there. It is less invasive and also you can avoid the uh, side effects of the distractors. And the food, which I have already mentioned, there are multiple causes, but what we as an ophthalmologist, we come across are the fibrous dysplasias. And these fibrous dysplasias, sometimes the patient are not even aware of it. <clears throat> it may be either a monoosthetic or a polyosthetic, but sometimes when we involve the monoosthetic, especially the frontal bone or the ethmoid, they come with mucosil. So this becomes a little challenging for us because when they have a mucosil, you need to remove the mucosil along with the fibrous dysplasia. But the other advantage is this only the fibrous component, the bone gets changed into a fibrous component. So it becomes much easier to remove this type of bone, which can be removed very well with a chisel or a mallet, or also you can use a saw and you can also do remove the whole bone. And you can see the nibbler being used to remove the bone. And if we look this, and, and this is the whole of this, I mean, uh, fibrous, fibrous component of the bone then has been removed. The patient had very less vision when he came to us. I think he had approximately yeah, 624 vision. And later within a week's time, we could see there has been much improvement in the patient. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, that was really a very wonderful talk and the surgery which you had done, it's really like, it felt like you were a magician, uh, especially the child with craniosynostosis. Uh, it was really a very nice surgery. Yeah, I have done only two cases because I feel that this is a very innovative technique. And But one good point that at least the five years I've been following the first child and like she is doing pretty well. Initially, I was a little skeptical. I was thinking there can be a recurrence and lots of counseling had to be done. But when I could see her even after five years, she is doing good and there is no recurrence of the laxation of bulbi. So I feel that I should do more number of cases to come to an exact conclusion. Uh, any comments from the panelists? <laughs> Excellent, uh, Kasturi. I think that was a very good uh, surgery and the outcomes are excellent. And that gives uh, justification in you venturing so boldly. Great job. Congratulations. Thank you, Visha. <clears throat> yeah, actually, these were really heroic surgeries and I don't think many people would dare to attempt such surgeries. So, Again, my compliments are also for you, and I think you must take these cases more often. Yes, uh, Dr. Mukesh, you know, us being the only tertiary eye care center in the Northeast, and they really wanted something to be done. So that's how I thought that, yes, like, and when she came, I initially tried with the sales technique that if I can push the eyeball, but it was not possible to do it at all. And she was in extreme pain. And it was not possible to do a tarsirophy, but there was so much of luxation bulb, but you cannot even do a tarsirophy. Then I tried putting hyaluronidase because sometimes like I have two, three cases of congenital teratoma, like by birth, you can see the whole of the eyeball has come out. So these are the situation where immediately you put in, you inject injection hyaluronidase, it, it decreases There's some amount of swelling and you can push back the glow or, or even you do a tarsirophy. We tried injecting hyaluron in this. It also did not work for this child. So ultimately we thought that something must be done and that's how we took up the surgery. <coughs> very good, really very good. Mm. 
are there any further comments if not then we can move to our next speaker our next speaker is dr melin nag sir sir heads the oculoplasty unit at lbpi hyderabad over to you sir sir will be speaking about the experiences uh, in thyroid eye disease hi thank you gunjan am i audible uh, yes sir you are audible so at the outset i would like to thank uh, gunjan namrata aios for this wonderful session uh, we had a parallel session in opai going on but i logged in here and i've been enjoying the talks as well as discussions so far so uh, my topic is about thyroid eye disease our experience and i'll just quickly take you through more of our research work back at lb prasad so when i was a resident uh, before the year 2000 all i learned was proptosis strabismus eyelid and aesthetics the classic uh, paradigm although i was only examining patients and back then in 2003 and 4 uh, this was pretty much the state of many of the thyroid patients that i would see in the clinic uh, they had significant complaints but there wasn't much being done about them at least in the ophthalmic community uh, for me uh, the real journey with thyroid eye disease began after my training with uh, bob goldberg at ucla and since the time i have come back from the us i really noticed that what we see back home and what i saw there as the so called western thyroid patient there was a lot of difference and i started to think whether our thyroid profile of patients is different uh, because i used to see children less often and strabismus issues less often as compared to what i saw there so i thought let's go deeper into this topic and when i started to look at what data we already have there was just one paper which talked about the prevalence of graves in patients who have graves disease graves ophthalmopathy in those who have graves disease and it just said that sight threatening was rare and the prevalence was pretty much close to 1/3 so thereafter we uh, decided to look at our entire spectrum of uh, thyroid patients seen over a decade which uh, amounted to around figure of 1000 and i'll just quickly go through this data which was starkly different from what has been reported from elsewhere so we looked at the female to male ratio and it was actually an inversion so despite the fact that there could be some referral bias here uh, when i compared it to other papers we noticed that as you come towards the east this ratio does blunt out uh, in its proportions age wasn't much of a drastic difference compared to the other papers but we found that pediatric thyroid eye disease as defined within 18 years was less and laterality was more we have more of unilateral disease than the rest of the uh, uh, populations talking about the systemic condition uh, patients who present to us with the u thyroid state is much higher as compared to uh, the other reported series ours being close to 1/3 uh, we also defined uh, something which we noted as silent presenters these are patients who lie within their first year of thyroid eye disease with normal serology no antibodies and no clinical activity score but just classic findings of uh, thyroid eye disease when we looked at the presenting signs obviously proptosis was more common but what was surprising was that lower eyelid retraction scored slightly higher in its uh, prevalence as compared to upper eyelid retraction and then we also had ptosis and microbial keratitis and i'll come to these uh, in a while so the summary of this demographic this was not population based but the demographic data from a hospital series suggested that uh, our patient group was younger there was a slight male preponderance and one third of patients are euthyroid and one third are silent presenters and we found that lower eyelid retraction was more common than upper eyelid 
and ptosis was identified in 5.6% of patients who presented to us and strabismus was quite rare so the need to have these combined clinics between oculoplasty and strabismus isn't something which we found to be necessary. Quickly touching upon the microbial keratitis, here is an example of an active disease uh, who was uh, found to have uh, C. pseudodiphtericum and S. pneumonia and we controlled this with cornea uh, management as well as a tarsorophy. And we realized that tarsorophy alone is often not enough in these patients. Sometimes you have to combine it with an elevator recession, even in the active disease. And the severe ones, sometimes they just end up in an evisceration and a prosthesis. So that's the spectrum of organisms. Gram negative was uh, uh, the most common. And we found that uh, the associated risk factors to develop an ulcer included active disease, severe eyelid retraction, severe motility issues, and uh, rest motility restriction, and male gender. Talking about upper eyelid, uh, it is classically known to be the sign of thyroid eye disease, but when we looked at uh, literature, most often it points out towards possibility of myasthenia. But when we looked at our data of 56 patients, uh, we found that only two had thyroid eye disease suspected in their referral to us. And we found that lower eyelid retraction was very common in these patients. And etiology wise, aponeurotic was more common cause than myasthenia, almost two thirds. And uh, this often masked the upper eyelid retraction as a kind of a sign of thyroid eye disease. So uh, just like how we have papers about simultaneous decompression and eyelid retraction correction, in these patients, we have done simultaneous decompression and ptosis corrections. Another interesting paper by Dr. Rath from our Bhubaneswar campus, uh, where he uh, mentions about uh, the, th uh, the dysthyroid optic neuropathy almost doubling if you have smoking or diabetes as the risk factors. Finally, coming to the point of lower eyelid entropion, this is something rare that we found in patients presenting with thyroid eye disease. We had a total of five patients, eight eyelids, a younger population, and it could either be medial or a complete lower eyelid entropion, and thickened mid lamella was the etiology found on the UBM. And most of them uh, which required surgical correction actually got corrected after the lower conjunctival incision for the floor and inferomedial decompression. So just a quick summary, uh, Indian patients with thyroid eye disease have a different spectrum. Uh, they are more unilateral, milder, and silent presenters being very common. And eyelid signs such as lower eyelid retraction is uh, more of an obvious finding in our spectrum. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that uh, enlightening talk about the differences in thyroid eye disease, which do exist between the Western population and our country. Uh, are there any comments from the panelists? Milan, nice talk and very good compilation of all your data. Uh, so overall, what do you say? What's your percentage of those who need surgery? Well, obviously, so the, if they uh, are quiet, uh, I'll finish it off. If they are quiet and they don't require steroids or immunosuppressors, you straight away take them for surgery or would you like to observe them? No, I would still consider them timeline wise as active and I would wait it out until one year arbitrarily or at least when I have successive measurements remaining constant. When given a chance, I convince the patient to wait for a year or a year and a half at least before we can take up anything surgical. But I find the role to uh, to operate more than to use anti-inflammatory just because of the silent nature and the mild nature of the disease. It, it might be interesting to check what is different in our spectrum of patients. Why is the disease relatively mild statistically? Did you consider checking their anti-thyroid antibodies also, especially in new thyroid cases? 
Yes. So that... you know whether they are active because the thyroids remain normal. But one of the antibodies may be raised and that may be showing signs of activity. So in which case would you have still considered quietening them or rather decreasing the level of proptosis or the fat inflammation because fat inflammation is a little difficult to say clinically. They may look quiet outside. Absolutely. So for you, thyroid, our definition was to have uh, normal antibodies and no abnormality detected in thyroid levels or no antibodies. Okay. Then that so was rough. Oh, sorry, please finish, finish. Yeah, yeah. It's still the same, on the same lines, I'd just like to know what percentage of cases would yeah. go for uh, uh, surgery treatment. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think we have more of a surgical load than the anti-inflammatory management role, uh, so to speak, because we might have so many patients who are silent presenters and who might just have lid retraction, which they would want to correct. But overall, the extreme cases with extreme proptosis beyond 26 is a little rare. And in our culture, the milder end of the spectrum, patient might just choose not to get operated. So, so overall, I would say maybe a third of patients really end up onto the table, the ones who have obvious findings. 33, 30% of your patients. Yes, but that's very hospital specific. This is this is not a population based data. Just a just a guess that I'm giving. Because I asked this because about a month or two back in one of the talks, Sarjini echoed the same things. I asked her the same, not so very clearly because there was not much of time. But she said that yes, quiet orbits also. If there is proptosis, we operate. So I wanted to clarify on that. Thank you. I may add a comment. Uh, uh, Helen, always wonderful translation of your observational skills, documentation skills, and translating into publications. I mean, you know, Singapore has this heterogeneous ethnic profile and Indians or Indian origin, seven to eight percent of population. Uh, incidence is about the same. I was wondering why you are probably seeing milder disease because 40 percent of your population is are very young people. Is that correct? I think the teenagers or 15 or less account for 40% of the population. So in other words, a percentage of elderly population who may either be presenting to you may be much lower. So wondering whether there might be a bias in the front because all the patients we've seen, at least just Chinese or Indian, the older they get, they have much severe disease. And we've seen the cross of the race. And I came to Singapore in 2002, I was told thyroid disease doesn't exist in Chinese. In two years, I started my thyroid eye clinic and we are one of the busiest thyroid eye services in this part of the world. So in other words, the more you start managing, and I think part of it could be related to the access or the referral patterns. Right. Youngsters are coming more to you, either as active or passive smokers, or even non-smokers, they're educated, well-traveled. Right. Older ones are all continuing to go blind and every single visit I come there, different parts of India, I see very elderly patients with very severe bad disease. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on those. Yeah, I agree. Uh, severe disease is seen in elderly patients, diabetics and smokers, and sometimes tobacco chewing is also associated with that. There's no good way to quantify that though. Uh, but yes, I, I do agree that uh, severe disease is seen more and slightly more in males and in the elderly population. Yeah, probably for whatever reason, not getting the access and the referrals. Could be. As much as the younger ones who are right. you know, well in because, because ours is a hospital base, definitely there could be some kind of a bias playing its role there. What's your take on selenium? I would like to ask both Dr. Sundar and uh, uh, Milind. Selenium? You mean uh, as a patient, yeah. yeah, what 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 has been your uh, observation on that aspect? Because there's a lot of talk around that now. Go ahead, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, lots of <clears throat> there are multiple reports coming on on selenium, vitamin D. I mean, uh, people are giving high dose of vitamin D in acute phase, and also the selenium. Basically, they're giving in more in the acute phase, where it is basically working as an antioxidant and whatever like as a supplement to uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. so take on that 
My, the truth is, I mean, you need 55 micrograms to up to 400 micrograms a day. And in nutritionally deprived populations, and there have been only two populations, one in South America and one in Italy, which nobody else in the world has been able to replicate selenium deficiency in the population, number one. Number two, selenium is readily available in your well-balanced diets, typically in the nuts that you eat, Brazil nuts as particular, but even your whole, whole wheat bread that you eat, and a lot of other nutritional supplements that you take, do have enough selenium that you have already. So I don't believe in giving dietary selenium supplements. I do encourage them to take these Brazil nuts or even some of the other nuts actually have enough selenium that you have, or eat whole grain food products, which I think India now healthy food is really coming in a big way. These patients, I don't think it has any bearing in terms of additional selenium. I think I agree with Dr. Ganga that selenium supplementation is really not necessary in our population. In fact, but excessive consumption has been result shown to cause diabetes and a lot of other medical problems as well. So you have to be a little careful. The, sorry, to, I shouldn't say this, but uh, uh, the other important thing is when people taking selenium supplementation alters your blood test results for your thyroid function and your antibodies as well. So you have to be a little wary of people who are taking these supplements. And a lot of these people, people are already taking a lot of alternative medicines, which whose constitutions you have no idea, which may have a bearing on what your test results are. Sorry to interrupt, Milan, sorry. I no, I, I was just saying that it's the, a good start would be to first find out whether our population has a deficiency of selenium and then think about whether thyroid patients should receive Uh, I think I don't remember now. Yugogo has once mentioned, I think, the use of selenium in mild disease, but it is only used as a supplement in mild condition, not in those which require surgery. <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm part of the Yugogo group, and uh, hmm. I, should, I shouldn't say I'm a complice to the crime, but uh, uh, Yugogo papers are all written based on evidence, and evidence is based on publications. So anything that's published has to be referenced in these evidence-based publications. But across the world, Rich can comment on this. Others can comment on it. No, None of these populations have been shown to be selenium deficient. So what's the point of supplementing a population which is not shown to be selenium deficient? And you can get it through natural sources. Yeah, so I had the opportunity of trying it out at 50 patients, and none of them showed a deficiency. And this was at a very high cost. Luckily, we were fortunate enough to be funded by. Uh, so, almost the analogy I always give is similar to the chlamydia and lymphomas. It was a hot topic years ago. People are giving tetracycline, doxycycline because one group showed chlamydia association with lymphomas, and none of the rest of the world has not replicated that. So, you have to be a little careful about some of these recommendations and evidence. Uh, Dr. Melind, I have a question for you. In your series, have you found any association between uh, optic neuropathy and patients with diabetes? Yes, that was the uh, Surya's paper I was talking about. Uh, I, due to lack of time, I didn't include his two more slides. But what he, sh he has shown, it was a series of 201 patients it's published in OPRS, where he talks about how the chances of developing compressive neuropathy almost doubles if yeah. you have diabetes and smoking as two separate risk factors. And definitely uh, in these patients who have vasculopathy, not only is the chances of dawn higher, but your surgeries, if, especially if you are going transorbital, you are likely to further compromise the, the vascularity of the retina and the optic nerve. So you might want to choose endonasal approaches in them. Thank you. So, if there are no further comments, we can move on. Uh, we can move to our next talk by uh, Dr. Ferros. Ma'am will be talking about orbital inflammation and enigma. Thank you, Gunjan. I'm going to share my slide here. I hope it's visible and I'm audible. Yes. Yeah. Respected chair, co-chair, uh, mentors who are in this platform, uh, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, so I will be talking on orbital inflammation today here. 
In fact, indeed, orbital inflammation is a very interesting topic, but equally challenging for an orbit oculoplastic surgeon and the patient as well. And I'm just going to go through a brief overview in the next eight minutes. Here, I have no financial disclosures or interest. So according to Rootman's classification, orbital inflammatory disease is uh, broadly classified as specific, which can include uh, granulomatous, which definitely has an etiology and a cause, or even vasculitis, as you see in this case over here, where a patient has vaginous granulomatosis and her presentation was with very painful proptosis and she also had nephropathy. So this is basically specific etiology oriented inflammation in the orbit. Now, uh, uh, this is a 65 year old lady who presented with diplopia and discomfort in the right eye, as you can see here. On imaging, the CT scan shows a very diffuse lesion involving the inferior and the lateral orbit, also including the inferior rectus muscle. And there's the MRI showing the inferior rectus muscle involvement. And in fact, this was referred to me as a case of uh, orbital inflammatory disease. So anterior segment evaluation, this is what I found. Uh, the bulba conjunctiva had multiple granulomas. Uh, so this is very, very classical and characteristic characteristic of sarcoidosis. And the only thing that I did was to go and take a biopsy of the conjunctiva and not that of the orbit. And she was proven to have sarcoidosis and was treated uh, conservatively. Now, going on to the non-specific ones, the current terminology is idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease, which is a space occupying lesion in the orbit, which is non-neoplastic, non-infectious, and it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So uh, most commonly uh, seen in adults unilateral, but yes, rarely we can see it in children as well. And sometimes it can be bilateral, it may be diffuse involvement of the orbit, or it can be localized uh, in different locations. It could be an anterior IOID, it can be a posterior one, including the lacrimal gland, uh, which is dacryoadenitis, myositis, epical, or even perineuritis. So this is a 12-year-old child who presents uh, with recurrent uh, periocular puffiness and swelling. And this is how she looks like. She has definitely periocular swelling. There is hyperemia, and she has severe photophobia. Anterior segment evaluation showed anterior uveitis, and ultrasound B scan evaluated showed tenonitis. So this is a case of an anterior IOID. So this is how important an anterior segment evaluation is in an orbital case, especially when you're suspecting an inflammation in the orbit. Well, she was treated with oral steroid and she did have a recurrence and finally uh, settled with uh, intravenous methylprednisolone. A uh, 38-year-old gentleman who presented with blurring of vision in the right eye, his best corrected visual acuity was 6 by 60 with diplopia when he presented. Color vision was abnormal. You can see uh, the right eye is dilated. He had an RAPD, and this is the imaging evidence of lateral rectus involvement, which is enlarged, and he had perineural uh, inflammation as well. So this was a case presenting as myositis with optic neuritis, who was again treated with intravenous methyl prednisolone, whereas actually uh, the vision improved to six by six. So this is a case uh, of a 20-year-old student who presented with severe acute swelling of the left eye, as you can see here. And there is also an S-shaped dosis of the right eye with periocular puffiness. So um, well, uh, the best corrected visual acuity when she presented was 6 by 60 because of the globe indentation and choroidal folds that she had at the phobia in the left eye. And there is evidence of an enlarged lacrimal gland in the left eye with globe indentation over here. And of course, there was enlargement of the lacrimal gland of the right eye also. And it was a case of bilateral dacryoadenitis. So 30 to 50% of lacrimal inflammation have associated systemic disorder, and it can be a simulating lesion. And this has to be ruled out before you term it as an idiopathic or vital inflammation. So in this paper of 97 cases, they found that 30% was idiopathic or vital inflammation and 20% accounted for sarcoidosis. So this patient had a recurrence uh, in May 2018, and then she had a severe recurrence again. And uh, well, uh, at this point of time, uh, we 
re-imaged and we found that there was enlargement of the lacrimal gland as well as there was some amount of uh, you know bony erosion of the roof and we went ahead with uh, a biopsy at this point of time so she went ahead with the lid crease incision biopsy and this was proven to be a sclerosing variant of IOID with vasculitis. The entire serology profile for autoimmune disorders was done. It was with the normal limits. The IgG4 was ruled out. And India being an endemic country with tuberculosis with a contiferon gold test positivity, she was was also put on ATT and then she did well and for the past three years she has been stable. This was a lady, a 56 year old lady who presented with proptosis associated with severe pain. In fact, with an ENT, she had undergone an endoscopic orbital biopsy and uh, the conclusive result was not available and the pathology report only stated vascular tissue and fat and uh, she had a loss of vision post-surgery when she presented to us, it was PL negative. And this was what we found, the medial rectus was enlarged, uh, uh, severe thickening of the medial rectus muscle. In fact, there is involvement of the paranasal sinus, but of course, an endoscopic surgery has been done in this patient. We went ahead doing a biopsy in this patient, and this came out to be a sclerosing variant of idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease. So biopsy is really, really important in such situation because orbital myositis can have different etiologies. It could be um, uh, in, uh, including autoimmune disorders, and very rarely it could be a lymphoproliferative disorder as well. And as far as orbital myositis, is concerned in idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease. Medial rectus is the most commonly involved as compared to the inferior rectus that we say in thyroid eye disease, which is again a very common cause for uh, uh, myopathy as Dr. Melinda has already presented, followed by lateral rectus, superior rectus. This is a very interesting case that I really, really wanted to take you through. This patient presented in a uh, in 2017, where initially he was diagnosed to have thyroid eye disease, uh, well, he didn't have uh, upper lid uh, retraction or a lower lid retraction. The only thing that was evident was a medial rectus enlargement in radiology, and he was euthyroid. In due course of his disease, as he progressed, there was involvement. Initial involvement was the inferior rectus, and that's why the referral uh, doctor had uh, diagnosed it as TED. But in due course of time, the medial rectus muscle, the lateral rectus muscle, and even the superior rectus LPS complex uh, got involved. And this is how he occurred at different uh, phases in his journey with uh, myositis and idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease. And this is how uh, the treatment was uh, uh, given. He, in fact, received a total of seven gram of IVMP with multiple recurrences, a systemic uh, azathioprine and even intraorbital uh, tramcinolone acetonide, and even one injection of rituximab was tried. Uh, and in fact, the journey was very, very frustrating for the patient. Ultimately, in 2019, it became mostly silent. And this was in 2021 that we had seen and he had no recurrence. This is a very interesting case where the patient presented with a uh, uh, history of redness in the right eye uh, two, since two years. And he has noticed that his eye is bulging for the past six months. And for the past four months, he has noticed that there is a nodule which is appearing in the lower lid and it has been progressively increasing. On examination, this is how you see it. There is actually a bulky lower lid. There is proptosis, almost nine millimeters with Hurtle's exophthalmometry. And this is a salmon colored lesion in the conjunctive. So with this clinical uh, presentation, in fact, I was almost sure that this could be a lymphoproliferative disorder. Well, his imaging showed that the entire inferior orbital uh, space was involved with the lesion, including the medial rectus, the inferior rectus, and the lateral rectus. And this is how diffuse the lesion was. So the, all, all I did was an inferior fornicial incision and went for an incision biopsy. And this was what we found. This is a very characteristic histopathological presentation of, uh, you know, presenting with storiform fibrosis, which is seen in IgG4 related disease. And you can see this predominant lymphocytes, lymphoid nodule. The immunohistochemistry uh, also showed IgG4 in plasma cells. And the serum IgG4 was much, much higher. The normal was, uh, the normal uh, level is 135. And this has, uh, uh, you know, elevated to 250 
milligram per deciliter. And this was diagnosed as IgG for related disease. So this is a very interesting paper, which was published and they found in 25 patients uh, with biopsy proven idiopathic orbital inflammation examined around 40 percent were IgG for positive. So this is something that we have to keep in mind with patients presenting with idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease, IgG for related uh, disease has to be uh, ruled out. And this is how it looks like after systemic steroids. A very interesting case diagnosed as myositis. Um, you know, uh, she was put on steroids, but there has been recurrence. And this is how her uh, superior rectus LPS complex is enlarged. Well, a biopsy was done and this came out to be a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So even lymphoproliferative disorders can simulate an idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease. And this is what I really want to highlight here today, the role of biopsy. 30 to 40 percent of biopsied inflammations are associated with a specific disorder and they can be a neoplasia also hiding along with other uh, autoimmune disorders or granulomas. So the take-home message from this presentation today is idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease is definitely an enigma. It can present in various uh, clinical forms, which has to be, you know, ruled out. And it is a diagnosis of exclusion, if you call it idiopathic. And biopsy, histopathology, and immunohistochemistry is really essential in diseases which is not responding to uh, treatment. Of course, systemic evaluation accordingly. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Oh, thank you, ma'am, for that enlightening talk. Uh, it is really a diagnosis of exclusion and can present like anything. Do we have any comments from the panelist? Just one comment. I just wanted to find out in what percentage of cases we may have to do multiple biopsies. You know, sometimes initial biopsy might turn out to be uh, non-specific, but eventually. Uh, ma'am, uh, ma uh, again, when we do a biopsy in such kind of an inflammatory disorder, there are situations where the patient was on steroids, all right, and then a biopsy is done immediately after stopping the steroids, which really doesn't work. For example, if it's a lymphoproliferative disorder, steroids really works for lymphoproliferative disorder also. So we have to make sure that the steroids are tapered and there is ample amount of time, like, you know, I go for three weeks, I wait for three weeks before I take a biopsy. And similarly, even, you know, for example, if you want to uh, assess the serological profile, like a C. anka or a P. anka in a patient, those patients with steroids, again, can have a false negative report if you do the serological evaluation. So these, these things have to be kept in mind when we go ahead with biopsies. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. And the other thing is you can, uh, it can masquerade with the steroids, even the rhabdomyosarcomas can, uh, you know, settle down because there's going to be a lot of inflammation around the tumor tissue. So yes. That can be misread. Yeah. So yeah, I'd like to make a comment. I thank uh, Dr. Farooz for all of her education that she has provided to us. Um, one thing I've learned recently is it's really important with these inflammatory diseases to call the rheumatologist mm -hmm. because there are certain medications like rituximab is now used once a year for patients with like adult onset xanthogranuloma. We have patients uh, who will get once a year rituximab and it keeps their xanthogranuloma at a low ebb. So certain things that I'm not up on, but I have to rely on a rheumatologist to tell me. Yeah, definitely, Dr. Carol. That's a very valid point. So all these disorders, especially the autoimmune disorder, it's a teamwork. Always yeah. a rheumatologist is involved in it. Yeah. yeah. We, we tend to run to steroids and that's okay. But once you get them on steroids and you start to reduce the inflammation, I think a phone call's valid. Yes. <laughs> I think one other thing to remember is uh, that you can have increased IgG4 staining in some lymphomas, and it can be really tricky for the pathologists. And so I've had a few patients just over the last year where they've gone back and forth as to whether it's IgG4 related disease or whether it's a lymphoma. Yeah. And so uh, again, something that you just need to be aware of. 
It's yeah, almost on a spectrum in my mind. I mean, I think there's a spectrum of disease and, you know, early on it's sort of IgG4 related inflammation and then that sort of uh, evolves into a lymphoma. It's very interesting, actually. Yeah, really true. So the case that I presented, I was so sure that it, you know, with the salmon patch appearance in the conjunctiva, that it's lymphoma. And I have to actually go back to my pathologist and made him do all the panel to rule out, you know, uh, all kinds of lymphoma from the low grade to the high grade. And then, yeah, yes, very, very true. Yeah, thank you. So thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, we can move to our next presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ferus, once again for that wonderful presentation. And now for our last presentation, I would like to invite Dr. Gunjan Saluja, who has been moderating this entire session very efficiently. Dr. Gunjan Saluja is presently working as oculoplasty and star business consultant at Bhilai Chhattisgarh. We are happy to have you here. Doctor, over to you. Yeah, we'll wait. Yes, we can see your presentation, ma'am. Maybe uh, make it to full screen. Yeah, yeah, just give me a minute. Perfect. A very good after, a very good evening, everyone. Uh, my topic today is management of canalicular obstruction, the new ways ahead. At the outside, I would like to thank uh, AIS for giving me this opportunity. So coming to canalicular blocks, canalicular blocks can be widely classified as proximal, distal, and common canalicular blocks, depending upon where are we finding the stop from the puncta. So to label it at, as a proximal uh, canalicular block, we should find a soft stop on probing up to 4 mm. For distal, it is a soft stop on probing at 5 to 10 mm. And common canalicular blocks are the ones in which the soft stops are present on probing at 10 mm from the puncta. So this this is how the normal anatomy is. And if the block is up to 4 mm, anywhere here, that will be labeled as proximal canalicular block. And when it is beyond that, that is at 5 to 10 mm, then that can be labeled as a distal canalicular block. So the common causes which are there are either most of them are idiopathic, some of them can be congenital, uh, could be secondary to neoplasms, sicker tracing lesions. Uh, very uh, rarely because of uh, medications and sometimes post-traumatic also, we can find these canalicular obstructions. So if you look at the con uh, conventional modalities of the treatment of uh, these canalicular obstructions, usually they are very uh, tedious and they have a large number of complications like tube migration, obstruction of tube, extrusion of tube, and secondary infection, collection of secretions, and diplopia. Moreover, they have variable success rates and surgery may not be the best option, especially in patients who are uh, at the extremes of ages like children and elderly debilitated patients who have multiple systemic illness. So what can be the safer options is what we are searching for now. Mostly, uh, if we have a proximal canalicular block, lacrimal Botox is one of the best options we can opt for. Uh, lacrimal Botox uh, is given in the main and accessory lacrimal glands who's, uh, who have a significant contribution to the basal and reflex tear production. Uh, it actually blocks the presynaptic release of acetylcholine, which is required for the tear secretion. The lacrimal Botox is uh, given directly. In, uh, we are giving 2.5 units per 0.1 ml of Botox uh, directly into the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland under visualization. Patient is asked, uh, this is an OPD procedure, and patient is asked to look at the intranasal direction, and the lid is retracted. One can use a Desmas retractor also to expose the palpebral lobe. Post-injection, uh, sometimes... Dry eyes can be a problem and hence artificial tears are usually advised. The review, if you look at the review of literature, various studies have proven its efficacy and have shown favorable outcomes with the non-surgical botulinum toxin. And they are actually safe. Uh, my experience has also been the same, especially in patients who are having proximal canalicular blocks, botulinum toxin does play a very important and a very good role and, very, and has good results with that. So the advantages are that it is easy, uh, it's less invasive, it is safe and reversible. Usually the effect lasts for around three months. 
but again yes repeated injections have to be given mostly th thrice or uh, four times we have to repeat the injections at the interval of around two to three months trephination is another option which is usually preferred in patients who are having distal canalicular blocks so distal canalicular blocks um, in these patients, one can use trephination. A mini trephine is a 21 gauge stainless steel tube, which is having a diameter of 0.181 mm and has a length of 16 mm. It is provided with a plastic handle and has a hub and an intraluminal stellate. Uh, excuse me for a minute. Uh, I'm really sorry for the interruption. Uh, so basically, it is having a stellate, which is metallic stellate and a plastic handle. And it can be used with a uh, syringe uh, or to a special unit. Actually, that can be used for the injection of mitomycin C if one needs to prevent the uh, formation of any post-operative uh, adhesions. So I would like to show a surgical video for the same. So first of all, local anesthesia is uh, given and puncta is dilated. Now following uh, the punctal dilatation, a probing is done to recheck our findings. Once we have confirmed that, uh, and we have now, as the, in this case, we found that the obstruction was at around 12 to 14 mm. Then we proceeded with the trephination. Uh, in this, uh, the trephine is introduced with the rolling movements of the hand. And following that, one can feel, uh, once we are crossing those fibrous adhesions, one can feel the giveaway feeling and a hard stop can be felt at the end. Mitomycin C uh, can be injected in this stage to prevent the post-operative adhesions. Syringing is done usually to check the patency of the passage. It is, it is simple procedure. It is less invasive. However, stent extrusion. At the end of the procedure, a mini monoca stent is placed so as to maintain the patency of the canaliculus. Uh, however, stent extrusion is one of the important limitations. Uh, pyogenic granuloma, false passage formation, and recurrences are some of the important limitations of this procedure. The reported success rate is around 52 to 92% in various studies. Laser canaliculoplasty is something which I have not experienced. I have uh, no experience in this, but it has been reported to be another non-invasive procedure in which canalicular obstructions can be opened using a modified Bowman's probe with a diameter of 1.1. The probe is attached to endoscopic and laser systems and a YAG laser of 800 nanometer is used to open the canalicular obstruction. The reported uh, limitations of laser canaliculoplasty include the epithelization of canalicular surface, delayed or abnormal healing, and predisposition to synechial closure. A balloon canaliculoplasty, uh, again, I have no experience in this, but has been reported, uh, that involves the transcanalicular placement of balloon catheter under fluoroscopic guidance at the site of stenosis to mechanically dilate and relieve the obstruction. Uh, the reported anatomic success rate was 40% at two years follow-up. Hence, the take-home message from this is canalicular obstructions can be managed in a simpler way using the less invasive methods like trephination and lacrimal botox. And this is especially true in children, chronically ill debilitated patients and in patients who are having multiple systemic illnesses. Although they might not need to be repeated, but they are simple and can be done as a minor procedure. You need not uh, need a separate OT. Also, sometimes it is just an OPD procedure which can be done. It saves time and reduces stress for the patient and surgeon also. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gunjan. Uh, do we have any questions for Dr. Gunjan? I just have a comment. A nice coverage, Gunjan, of all the pages techniques. Would you still call laser uh, canalicular uh, <clears throat> opening as non-invasive? Because when uh, you use a laser and go via, it'll, it is likely to open some addition. There may be a little bit of a nose. I don't know whether to call it uh, non-invasive. It is uh, invasive. Yeah, it is know. invasive. Uh, most of the procedures which we do for the canalicular system are invasive because we have to put something into the canaliculus to open the adhesions. So yes, they are all invasive types, but definitely they are not as invasive as a conjunctival DCR or placing a Pyrex tube. So in that... Uh, yeah. on less invasive. Yeah, <laughs> less invasive will be a better term, I think. I really don't know. Over the years, I just feel that Whatever you do, there will be some amount of scarring. Maybe the monocanalicular stent will work there. And uh, it, we just need to really know what's the long-term outcome. Mm -hmm. Yes. Adding mitomycin C does help. Uh, mm -hmm. It does help to prevent the formation of adhesions in the long term. I have uh, one and a half years, I have a follow-up. So there is a, uh, no adhesions are not formed. Uh, and there is no, less amount of recurrence with mitomycin C. Do you have a use an endoscope to visualize where your probe is coming into the common canaliculus? Because you don't know what is the end point. Ganga, please go ahead with your question. Oh yeah, so I think she she told, chose one of the toughest toughest topics to yeah. talk about because it's quite frustrating to manage these canalicular obstructions, right? It's more than, I always say, uh, DCR is more than making a hole between the eye and the nose and putting a tube through. And likewise here, you're talking about putting a trifine and putting a tube through, but that doesn't always translate into anatomical sometimes and even functional success. Uh, one of the important things is most fibrosis occurs over say 30, uh, three month period and another 10% occurs beyond that, way beyond that, even up to a year. So just because you put a tube through doesn't mean that you've got patent C. Even if you've got epithelial lining with this diffuse stenosis, without an obstruction, patients are oftentimes quite symptomatic. So we tend to use a, what is called a large diameter stent tube, which is 1.3 millimeter diameter times two, so it's 2.6 millimeters. Leave it in for three to four months after whether you do a trephination or any other the procedure. The occasional dacre endoscopy, Lakshmi, to answer your question, we have seen is nothing but fibrosis actually you see. So the lacrimal endoscope on our side does not show anything much except fibrosis. But when you establish patency to the lacrimal sac and it gives you confidence that you're truly intraluminal when you do this intubation. So dacre endoscopy gives you that little extra verification, which we have been for decades using a blind procedure. It's similar to a nasal endoscopy. So the trick is to maintain your intubation. I saw you using your probe, which is a very, very thin probe. To me, thin probes are not good enough to show patency. You want to use a medium to slightly larger than medium-sized probe, because a thin probe can go through anything. But the ease of passage of a medium-sized probe into the lacrimal sac, in my opinion, is the true one for measure of success, in addition to spontaneous fluorescein flow. Thank you. A great talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was true because mostly the thin probes, they are also quite notorious and they create false passages also and gives a false sense of success, which is not there. So syringing has to be done at the end of the procedure, definitely. Passive flow. Passive flow is the toxic. It's not a matter of syringing, actually. Even passive flow has to be established. In fact, uh, most of my Bowman probes, says the thin probes are all out. It's only the medium-sized probes and larger, it's only single probe. Thanks very much for a wonderful evening. Sorry, it's way past midnight for me. I enjoyed you, being with you all. Yeah. Thank Thank you, for Good, night. Good night to all. Thank you, everyone. Gunjan, excellent Thank you, uh, yeah. <laughs> topics, and we enjoyed it. Thank you so much for organizing. Thank you, this. Gunjan. Yeah, it was really nice. And every and like only one thing I missed the first two lectures because a parallel session was going on. 
and all the lectures went to very well. Lots of learning points, very insightful discussions. Congratulations. Same to you, Kasturi. Your talk was good. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Like when Gunjan asked me, I was doing a coloboma. Then when she told me, that, I said, okay, let me talk about this. Then later I realized, oh my God, whether I have good connections or not. Luckily, I could take out all my old files. But the TCS yes. are real difficult situations. Like, um, first and foremost, sometimes, many times, I don't know whether you have come across, but I see there also no. They have some delayed milestones too. Many of the patients I have seen with delayed milestones. And at times it is difficult to handle those patients and the follow-up especially is not very, they do not come for the regular follow-up. Like the first case that I have shown you with where I have only given the iliac crest bone and like she has just lost to follow-up. But in spite of trying so much also, we are not getting her back because I realized that I need to fill this more with some soft tissue. And so what I have decided now in the same sitting, better to go for the bone graft and also the soft tissue graft. How was the success, uh, you know, with the, the, how is the acceptance of the graft? Is it better with the, you know, like you're using multiple grafts? Yes, Usha, you're right. Like uh, there is always, we are told that no two grafts should be together, right? But that does not, that is not in the case of bone. In the case of bone, a bone, if it is in contact with another bone, the chance of bone necrosis is less. But in soft tissue, they cannot be two grafts together. And these are only cancerous bone. Like uh, people, what they do, like um, they just, these are very thin bones also. You just need to cut it with a 15 blade also. And you take the cancerous part. And even if you put the cancerous part, just scoop off the cancerous part and put it in the defect, the bone really feels. First case, have you noticed, I have taken only the cancerous part. And it is the second only I have taken the cortical cancer because when I opened it, it was a big defect. I was not knowing what to do. So sometimes... What about bone resorption in, after two or three years? Bone resorption, if there's a bone-to-bone -bone contact, ma'am, the bone resorption is not there. Usually it is not there. But there can happen because we need to follow up for pretty long. Like the Cruzon case, no, I was really scared. The first case, I was thinking that there'll be bone resorption. So only thing at that point of mind, I was thinking, okay, let me keep the contact. So as I was moving it, posteriorly, everything was in contact. Only anteriorly, I was putting the plate. And when I've been silly, uh, saying her uh, till last five years, like she's doing pretty good. Like nothing much worse has happened to her. So maybe there can be bone resorption to more number of cases, but these are very limited cases, like one case in seven, eight months. And that too, when everyone refuses, those are the cases to take up because these cases can be managed by a neurosurgeon, uh, maxillofacial surgeon also, maybe with the distractors they are doing. These are challenging cases, but uh, just a trial and error I'm trying. I think you have to, you will be the first person to take care because the mandibular distraction should be done a little later. You can't do it much as early on as what you do. It has to be taken a little later on, maybe after about seven, eight years or so, that will be the ideal time. So in the initial period, oculoplastic surgeons definitely play a very big role. I think so, ma'am. I have done only for two patients this no, orbital malar. Like, you know, I have done lots of maxilla surgery. I don't know, coincidentally, or how it is coming to me, but cavernous hemangio of the maxilla, I have got five cases, intra-osseous cavernous hemangio, uh, hemangio of the maxilla. So those are also very interesting cases, five cases, like within two, three years, I got five cases. So I don't know, like if I do more surgery, then I think I should be able to know that. But I think five years is a pretty long time for the first child. Uh, yeah, those results were very yeah uh, the five years. So yeah, saying that like i don't know this is one of my favorite picture you know and she had sent me a video where she was dancing <laughs> and it was such a sweet to see her growing up she came to us when she was nine months or ten months not even a year but now she's almost five years <clears throat> and all these craniofacial disasters great great result and you seem to have a master touch always i see that but but this become some of the very few urgent surgeries that we do on pediatrics uh -huh. genital deformities 
So we keep a very low threshold for FOA's front orbital advancement at stage one, where we move your entire roof forward. You do not have to have bony contact because like in distraction osteogenesis, you have up to even five millimeters, even sometimes even up to one centimeter difference between the bones. As long as they're plated together and it's not mobile bone, bone beautifully grows in between. Yeah. Times. The so the stability, yeah. Sorry, the mobility or stability is what is most important. So the yes. first stage will always be the FOAs. So you get the upper lid, like exactly what you've done, upper lid advancement. You don't need any soft tissue intervention at all. And then same sitting or a second stage, then you do a lower face, mid face advancement at a much older stage. In acute situations, what I found very useful in sublux globes, people don't realize that. All you do is do a canthotomy and a cantholysis. Yes. That is what is really keeping making the eyelids tight in a sublux globes. When you do the canthotomy cantholysis, that itself relaxes the eyelid quite a bit. It gives you, because there's no socket volume for you to reposition the globe. Uh, There's no point pushing the globe back because it's shallow orbits. You have to actually move the bone forward. This is exactly what you've shown. So you're right. I mean, combination of uh, bony advancements, uh, stabilizing the bone, doing it as a single stage or multiple stage procedure, doing it with a neurosurgeon or maxillofacial surgeon. So, you know, great, great case and very pretty girl as well. Asturi, the sliver of bone which you take out during the frontocranial advancement, as Ganga has mentioned, that bone, that strip of bone, where you leave that gap purposely, just plating it and not mobile, where further tissue will regenerate, that strip of bone may not go a waste. You can use that bone itself to reconstruct the lower aspect. I've done that along with a plastic surgeon in two cases. But And sometimes the bone may stick up a little bit through the skin. You'll have to trim it a little bit. But I think that for cruisons works well. The idea is the eyeball should not pop out. Yes, ma'am. The yeah, ideal is if it does not proptosis, it's too much of proptosis. Mm. So what the craniofacial or the maxillary, they do the distraction osteogenesis. They do a lift for three and they put the distractors. Every month, uh, mm. uh, and every monthly, they uh, like they turn the knob so that it keeps on pulling with the concept of callus forms. Mine is also something like a distraction osteogenesis because I, I cannot, it's already a bad eye. So what I had, I had just kept a posterior bone intact, but the anterior was open, I mean, open with a concept of a callus field form. And uh, as Ganga has mentioned, no, only to keep it immobile. I have put the traction, I mean, the titanium plates. It is. Excellent. And that way you're doing it in an eye hospital. It's really, truly commendable. Okay, good night. I sign up. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, maybe have a quick uh, group photograph if uh, if that is possible for everyone. I request everyone to kindly switch on their camera. Dr. Melin, if you, I request you also to kindly switch on the camera if it is possible. All right. So thank you, everyone. Let's say cheese. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. So thank you. And we shall meet tomorrow at 9. Thank you. 7.30, no? We have the... Yeah, for Hall E, it is 7.30. Like overall, uh, in Hall E, it will start at 9 a.m. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Lakshmi, my mom I'm calling you for my throat. You take up the phone now.